A swarm of bloodthirsty entities waits outside the protective boundary that surrounds the solar system. They surge through the vacuum of space looking for vulnerabilities in the force field that protects us from their destructive powers. The creatures ran themselves against the barrier again and again, trying to break through. Upon impact, the force field shimmers a golden color and displays a series of thaumaturgical symbols, but it holds. Suddenly, something flies through the protective shield from inside the solar system. It leaves a hole. Two creatures enter our solar system before the shield closes. This may be the end for humanity. The sixth overseer sits at a computer terminal massaging the bridge of his nose. He has just logged into the Foundation database to gather information on an anomaly whose intentions are still unknown. The O5 Council wants him to vote on an extreme measure, but he requires more information first. There is something coming, he can feel it, and he thinks it has something to do with SCP-1548. O5-6 straightens his back and sits up in his chair. He logs back into the Foundation database and brings up the entry for SCP-1548. He knows that this SCP has been connected to some odd occurrences recently, but what are its true intentions? Is SCP-1548 trying to help save the universe? Or is it a malicious entity hell-bent on destroying it? O5-6 must find out. He scrolls through the first few entries. SCP-1548 itself is a series of solar phenomena that occur at the south pole of the sun. During these events, the sun's plasma morphs into different thaumaturgical symbols. Each symbol is tens of thousands of miles across. The symbols themselves have not all been classified by the Foundation yet, but there are three that have been observed multiple times. The first is an unnamed symbol that, when inscribed on a telescopic device by a person with thaumaturgical abilities, can identify psionic entities with malicious intents. The second symbol is known as the Calfastian Isle, which when displayed on a material, strengthens it immensely and gives it the ability to absorb kinetic and electromagnetic energy. The final symbol is the Twelve Holy Owls of Cerinthium. When this symbol is affixed to an object, any entity that is killed by it will immediately annihilate and take everything in its radius with it. O5-6 jots a note on the pad of paper sitting on his desk. He has seen some of these symbols before. They are connected to the Ortuthan mythology. The practitioners of this religion are known as the Church of the Second Hytoth and are a mix of human and alien entities whose main purpose is to aid the guardian deity of the universe, Rakmu Liosen, in combating any threat that may try to wipe out this existence. There must be a connection between the Church of the Second Hytoth and SCP-1548, O5-6 thinks. He scrolls back through the SCP-1548 file to the entry logged on May 17, 1983, the first time an event connected to SCP-1548 was recorded. A probe picked up the manifestation of thaumaturgic symbols on the south pole of the sun. It was odd, but nothing other than the manifestation of the symbols seemed to occur. This event was recorded as Extra Normal Event 9008 and logged into the SCP database. The event was all but forgotten until December 23, 2016, when the activity of SCP-1548 really began to pick up. On that day, SCP-1548 began manifesting protection symbols in rapid succession. Over the next few months, a dense cloud of ionized gas formed around the solar system. This ionized wall of radiation surrounded the heliopause, the boundary where the sun's radiation gives way to the vacuum of space. Over time, this cloud became thicker, until no light from outside of the solar system could enter. Foundation censorship protocols were quickly used to disseminate false data, suggesting that the solar system was passing through a dense cloud of cosmic dust, and that was what was altering the night sky and causing the stars to disappear. But as O5-6 continues to scan the files, he knows what the true cause of this phenomenon is. It must be SCP-1548, but why? Is the anomaly trying to protect us from something outside of our solar system, or is it trying to trap humanity within, with no means of escape? O5-6 stands up and stretches. Ah, oh, that's enough for today, he says out loud to the empty room. He walks towards the door and reaches for the handle. All of a sudden, sirens start going off and red lights begin to flash. O5-6 spins around and runs back to the computer terminal. 
an emergency alert begins coming through. The Falcon Light 5 rocket that launched earlier in the day to bring supplies to the International Space Station has spontaneously lost 50% of its mass mid-flight. 05-6 frantically begins typing. He brings up videos from surveillance satellites. The overseer watches in horror as pieces of debris and bodies of the crew flow through the silence of space. The rocket looks like it has been cut directly down the middle, and half of the structure has vanished from existence. What is happening? Suddenly another alert comes in. All communication has been lost with the International Space Station. Without warning, the space station begins broadcasting a series of cognito hazards. 05-6 quickly changes the channel to stop the signal from transmitting through his computer. Reports start coming in from around the world that anyone who continued listening to the cognito hazard signals began entering trances. Then their brain completely evaporated from their skulls. There is a surge of thaumaturgic particles in orbit around the Earth. 05-6 traces the particles back to their source. They came from SCP-1548. The signal from the ISS stops abruptly. The entire space station changes course. It is on a trajectory to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. The friction and heat will rip the space station apart. 05-6 can't believe what is happening. It seems as if SCP-1548 helped humanity in a way by stopping the signals from the ISS. But how can he be sure that SCP-1548 wasn't responsible for the cognito hazards in the first place? He needs more information. 05-6 searches for answers as more anomalies connected to SCP-1548 start occurring around the world. During a political demonstration in Berlin, a thaumaturgic way opens up that leads to a pocket dimension. Soon after, the appearance of the portal, Koru Archpriest Farah Atenas, the leader of the Church of the Second Hightoth, makes an announcement. He claims that the way leads to a shelter, which will protect people from the coming doom of the universe. The people in the area, along with the members of the Church of the Second High Toth, make their way into the portal. Two undercover Foundation agents follow the group. After everyone has entered, the way immediately closes, and there is no further contact. What does the Church of the Second High Toth know that we don't? 05-6 wonders. He continues monitoring the situation and looking for answers. Suddenly a message comes through all Foundation channels. It is coming from the Sun. It is not SCP-1548. Instead, it is SCP-179, the humanoid permanently in space near the Sun. 179 sends out one clear word in its signal. Defend. Who is SCP-179 talking to? 05-6 thinks. What needs to be defended? Is it humanity? Our solar system? The universe? Another alarm begins to go off. What now? 05-6 screams. He brings up the alert. The screen flashes to the moon. 05-6 focuses in on where the alert is coming from. It is a foundation base called Area 32. What remains left of the base is reporting that SCP-2821 suddenly expanded in size, formed a wormhole that led to another region of the universe, and then vanished through it, taking 38 Foundation members and 10 anomalies with it. Sirens continue to go off. Distress signals are being picked up on every channel. It seems as if the world is coming to an end, and everything that is happening is somehow connected to SCP-1548. A static-filled transmission begins coming in from SCP-3417. The words are urgent. All our Tuthans here. All our Tuthans must listen now. The stars are lost. Static breaks up the transmission for a few moments before it resumes. Ago the first invasion occurred. The gods were unprepared, never comprehending the fragility of the universe after its creation. The worlds must fight. The transmission cuts off. Everything goes silent. A pulsating SCP icon appears on the screen of 05-6's computer. It is the part of the puzzle he has been waiting for. In 1999, the O5 Council unanimously voted to launch a mission called Seraph-1 to explore beyond the heliosphere. And the mission's true purpose was to explore the plausibility of extraterrestrial SCP objects in space. The message that O5-6 just received is from Seraph-1. It is relaying information back to Earth. The video shows the barrier of ionized radiation that SCP-1548 had created glowing orange at the border of the heliopause. The radioactive wall seems to be made up of complex geometric patterns around 6,000 miles across. Seraph-1 accelerates towards the barrier. It smashes through the protective shell. The probe has entered interstellar space. 05-6 knows that everything he is seeing is on a delay. 
as the information being sent back by Seraph 1 needs to travel vast distances, and it takes significant time for signals to reach Earth. After passing through the ionized barrier, the connection to Seraph 1 is lost. Over the next few days, O5-6 tries to link the anomalies happening in the solar system to SCP-1548. The Foundation still hasn't concluded if 1548 is harmful or trying to protect the solar system in some way. Then a message comes in from Seraph-1. It has briefly regained communication with the Foundation. Most of the probe's instruments have been destroyed, but its rear-facing camera is still broadcasting. O5-6 pulls up the feed. He stares at the screen in horror as the images unfold before him. The camera captures swarms of unknown entities surrounding the heliopause. The bodies of the entities are asymmetrical with countless appendages and unknown structures jutting out from their cores. They seem to range in size from 10 kilometers to 10,000 kilometers across, although some seem so large that their size can only be hypothesized. The swarms crash into the protective barrier that SCP-1548 has created around the solar system. Each time part of the swarm rams the barrier, thousands of thaumaturgic symbols and solar flares appear at the point of impact. Two entities that are later classified as 1548 Omega-1 and 1548 Omega-2 are captured entering the solar system by Seraph-1's camera. Video from Seraph-1 shows that as the probe exited through the protective barrier, it created a hole that remained open for a few moments. During the time that the shield of ionized radiation was vulnerable, 1548-Omega-1 and 1548-Omega-2 entered through it. They are now inside the solar system. SCP-1548 launches countermeasures in the form of glowing red sigils that create shockwaves to slow down Omega-1 and Omega-2. Omega-1 is shaped like an eel with five contorted arms radiating from its body and a mouth made of impossible geometric shapes. Omega-2 has a tetrahedral structure that leaves a trail of black rocks in its wake. As the two entities move towards the sun, SCP-1548 becomes more active. It closes the hole in the barrier before any other creatures of the swarm can enter, and then launches hundreds of concentrated blasts of thalmic energy at Omega-2. The flares vaporize the entity in seconds. The last thing the video feed of Seraph-1 captures before it cuts out is Omega-1 disappearing from view as it creeps towards the center of the solar system. It has escaped the protective measures of SCP-1548. After the O5 Council reviews the footage, they decide to deploy the SCPS Cortana to intercept Omega-1. The orbital vessel is fully equipped with experimental anomalous weapons and propulsion systems. The Council is sure that the Cortana will be able to destroy Omega-1. Data coming in from other satellites indicate that Omega-1 has destroyed Pluto and other Kuiper Belt objects. It is slowly making its way to the center of the solar system, annihilating everything in its path. The Cortana intercepts Omega-1 near Jupiter and engages the creature. After 10 minutes of battling, communication with the ship is lost. Probes in the area capture footage of the Cortana and Omega-1 in mid-battle when they are suddenly surrounded by a black substance and both vanish from sight. O5-6 and the other council members watch in anticipation, unsure of what has just happened. Then the black substance dissipates. The SCPS Cortana sits motionless in space. The entity is nowhere to be seen. A cheer erupts from the overseers and foundation members in the room. It seems the entity has been defeated. Then, without warning, the Cortana accelerates rapidly. It is on a collision course with Mars. As the ship hurtles past one of the probes in the asteroid belt, the Foundation members see an organic mass resembling that of Omega-1 attached to the hull of the ship. The Overseer Council watches in horror as the SCPS Cortana smashes into the Red Planet, leaving a crater 250 miles wide. The energy released from the impact instantly ionizes the thin atmosphere of Mars, causing the surface to turn into molten rock. From the epicenter of the impact crater, a black organic mass begins to crawl across the planet. The overseers are frozen in fear, but SCP-1548 immediately deals with the entity that is devouring the surface of Mars. From the sun comes the largest SCP-1548 instance ever recorded. A solar flare is jettisoned towards Mars. The impact causes a fusion reaction so intense that for a moment, 
Mars shines as brightly as the Sun. The planet explodes. Its debris is cast across the solar system. Over time, it will create a second asteroid belt in the orbit that Mars once inhabited. The Overseer Council is now convinced that the threat has been dealt with. SCP-1548 is holding the swarm at bay outside of the solar system, at least for the moment. O5-6 returns to his office. He brings up the file on SCP-1548. He is still unsure of this SCP's true intentions. It seems to be protecting humanity, but why? O5-6 sits back in his chair and scrolls to the end of the file. There is an update to the file by O5-3, something that wasn't there before. O5-6 opens the new entry and reads the caption, All that's left of our infinite, ever-expanding universe. O5-6 scrolls down. The image is a picture taken by Seraph-1 before contact was lost forever. It is a picture of all that remains of the universe. There are two dots of light, and nothing else but blackness. The swarm has destroyed everything in the universe, except for those two faraway stars, and our own solar system, which was protected by SCP-1548. But how long can it hold out against a universe-destroying force? Only time will tell. A man is sitting in a chair inside a containment cell at the SCP Foundation. The man is dressed normally, and he isn't trying to escape or attack the researchers who are observing him. The only thing that makes this man different from you or I is that he ages right in front of us, going from a teenager to an old man in a matter of minutes. At first glance, SCP-1007 looks very normal, just a corpse lying in a standard coffin. Well, the corpse of an old man in a coffin being kept locked up in a containment chamber is normal when compared to some of the other strange anomalies that are found in the SCP Foundation's archives. Inside the coffin with SCP-1007 is a small metal key, and this is quite literally the key to seeing what makes this anomaly so special. On SCP-1007's back, between his shoulder blades, is a small keyhole. X-ray scans of 1007 have shown that the keyhole is just an empty socket. It's unconnected to anything. There's no internal clockwork mechanisms or other machinery that should be able to be activated by a key. When the metal key that is kept in SCP-1007's coffin, classified as SCP-1007-1, is inserted into the keyhole on 1007's back and turned, something truly incredible happens. As the key is turned, SCP-1007 undergoes a change unlike anything the SCP Foundation has seen before. With each turn of the key, the subject's physical age is reversed by one full year. Foundation researchers are able to watch 1007 age in reverse in real time. Even any decay that had set in on the corpse is completely reversed and disappears as the key is wound and 1007 gets younger and younger. As the key is turned, 1007 will continue to de-age, physically compacting and shrinking down until it appears to have the form of a newborn human child. It's unknown where the physical mass of 1007's body goes to, since this should defy the laws of physics. But those laws we assume to be a bedrock of our universe's reality are often more of a suggestion when it comes to anomalies the SCP Foundation deals with. Once SCP-1007 reaches the newborn baby stage, it will suddenly reactivate, coming to life immediately, regardless of how long it has been dead and lying in its coffin. Once 1007 is brought back to life, he will go through the entire human life cycle within a 75-minute period. Experiencing what looks to be approximately one year of normal human growth and development for every minute that passes. That means that in the course of about 16 minutes, researchers will see SCP-1007 change from a crying infant to a fully grown teenager. As you can imagine, the subject has reported feeling excruciating pain during these first few minutes, as his bones rapidly lengthen and expand, and his muscles develop and change shape dramatically. SCP-1007 is able to watch with his young eyes as his bones move and set themselves into place, lengthening and widening in seconds during growth spurts that normally take months or years. After about five minutes, provided his legs have grown to the same length at the same time, he's usually able to prop himself up and stand. At around 10 minutes, the pain really starts. The bones crack and ache as they grow at their fastest for the whole cycle. 
Hair will also grow on his face and body, and he can't help but feel some amount of shame and embarrassment at what's happening to him in front of the Foundation researchers, who are taking copious notes. By 20 minutes, he can hardly think due to the pain. At this point, he usually lies down and curls into a ball, whispering to himself that it will all be over soon, that the pain won't last forever. After another 10 minutes, he's right. The pain has almost stopped completely by the 30-minute mark, but now, as wrinkles and stretch marks start to set in, a different kind of pain reveals itself, as SCP-1007 realizes that he must watch himself die. 40 minutes in, and he starts to reflect on his past, the life he was forced to lead as a kind of sideshow freak. More on that later, though. The physical decay happens faster now, warts and moles and other marks of age appearing on his skin. After 50 minutes, he is aware that over half of his life has passed, and he is reaching the end. His hair starts to fall out as do his teeth, which he's never actually been able to use as he's never tasted food. As the 60-minute mark comes and goes, he begins to feel grateful for the coming end, with the escape from pain and the rest it would bring. His body has become very wrinkled by this point and is covered with age spots. His eyes begin to cloud, severely limiting his ability to see, and his hearing gets weaker and weaker until he can't comprehend anything the researchers say. At 75 minutes, it's all over. SCP-1007's body expires and he dies once again. He will remain as a corpse until the metal key is inserted into his back and the whole process starts once again. Just as there appears to be no explanation for where the mass of SCP-1007's body goes as the key is wound during the reversal process, so too is there no explanation for where the energy needed for his rapid growth comes from. This process should violate the first law of thermodynamics, and Foundation researchers are very curious about the underlying process. The one constant that remains on SCP-1007's body is a small tattoo on his right calf, where the words Mr. Life and Mr. Death from Little Misters by Dr. Wondertainment appear. This matches up with entry number 11 on document SCP-909, which lists a total of 20 Little Misters. SCP-1007 was recovered by Task Force Tau-6 during a raid on a mansion in California, along with several other anomalous creatures and objects. The owner of the mansion claimed that he acquired SCP-1007 at an auction hosted by Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited. Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited is a club based in London, England, that is famed for collecting and selling what it would describe as rare and obscure objects. Unfortunately, this often includes various anomalies that should be under the care of the SCP Foundation and the club's mission to provide its members with exclusive, expensive, and rare experiences means that they're often in conflict with the Foundation, and they have even been responsible for several containment breaches. Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited continues to be a very secretive organization, and the name of the director and a list of its members have so far been very difficult to obtain. At the auction they hosted where SCP-1007 was offered for sale, there were apparently, along with Mr. Life and Death, at least four other misters for sale, though the identity of the other buyers and which little misters they may have purchased is still under investigation. The fact that SCP-1007 has the name Mr. Life and Mr. Death seems to imply that he may have originally been part of a set, though this counterpart little mister has yet to be recovered or even identified. In interviews with SCP-1007, he has given his own personal theory that he embodies both names, and the designation is a reference to the way he alternates between life and death. However, the possibility still remains though that he may have a twin of sorts, and the Foundation continues to investigate its possible identity and location. SCP-1007's brief 75-minute life followed by a death that lasts until he is rewound by a special key means that he is easily contained and has been classified as safe. He is only to be activated during routine testing, and after experiencing death, he is to be placed back into his coffin along with the key. In keeping with current regulations for all anomalies that have been designated as misters, SCP-1007 is to be contained in Hall 8 of Site-13 for additional observation and study. SCP-173 it's one of the most iconic anomalies ever contained by the SCP Foundation. 
This next snapping Site 19 celebrity is known and feared by everyone who works at the foundation since being contained in 1993. Its nubby concrete hands metaphorically and quite literally stained with the blood of countless people. But this mostly immobile oddity wasn't always a resident of Site 19, and the story of how exactly it ended up there, and more importantly why, is far more ridiculous, insane, and downright terrifying than you could ever imagine. So buckle up, SCP fans, this is the dramatic tale of how this homicidal piece of modern art ended up at the SCP Foundation's largest containment site. To give you an idea of just how weird this origin story is, we're gonna have to leap forward to the year of 2045. We know what you're thinking. Isn't this a prequel? How can it take place in the future? Sit tight, folks. It'll all make sense in the end. Site 91 is where we lay our scene, under the watchful eyes of Site Director Dr. James Long, a senior researcher with level 4 security clearance, the second highest at the Foundation. Dr. Long had given decades of devotion and his expertise to the Foundation. He was a proud man who wore his life of service to the containment cause as a badge of honor. After years of dodging death while researching some of the most dangerous anomalies that Site-91 had to offer, he had ascended to the rank of Site Director which represented the culmination of his life's work, and in his new position of power, he'd only proved himself further, running a tight ship and reducing the number of containment breaches across the board. Nobody could say that Dr. Long wasn't extremely talented at his job, which is why he was so confused when he received an email from Alexandra Nala, an administrative assistant working directly for the O5 Council. It was the type of email that no site director ever wanted to receive. Dr. Long was being told that, with no input or oversight from him, the majority of Site-91's anomalies were going to be taken to an undisclosed location for safer containment. The list contained nearly every meaningful detainee contained on the site, including, of course, SCP-173. This particular anomaly had been contained at the site for 37 years after being delivered there in 2008. Dr. Long had devised a perfect method to minimize containment breaches in that time, creating a sprinkler system within the chamber that washes away the waste products produced by 173, reducing the need for risky human contact. But that didn't matter. Despite Dr. Long's loyalty and efficacy in serving the SCP Foundation, the decision had already been made, with no chance of reversing it. According to Nala, the motion to remove most of Site-91's anomalies had received unanimous approval from the O5 Council, and the operations for the transfer would be commandeered by the Department of Extra Universal Affairs, headed by Senior Agent Sven Kish. Dr. Long was both upset and confused. He was producing some of the best results across the entire Foundation, so why were they taking away all of his anomalies? Did someone on the O5 Council have it out for him? Dr. Long replied to Nala asking if, considering how severe the relocation operation was going to be, whether he could get more information on where the anomalies were being moved to, and why. He felt that at the very least, he was owed some answers on this. Nala and her superiors didn't feel quite the same way. She replied that Dr. Long sadly didn't have the clearance to know any of the operation's particulars. This information was reserved for those with level 5 clearance, and members of the multi-universal department. All that Dr. Long needed to do was stay out of the way, and everything would be taken care of for him. But that wasn't enough for Dr. Long. He needed to know more. He needed to understand why this seemingly random decision had been made. Realizing that Nala and the O5 Council were a dead end as far as information was concerned, he instead reached out to the next best thing, Senior Agent Sven Kish, the member of the Department of Extra Universal Affairs who was spearheading the relocation mission. Dr. Long implored the agent to give him extra information on where all the Site-91 anomalies were being moved, and why they were being moved in the first place. Predictably, he was once again stonewalled, being told that any information regarding the project was above his level of clearance. In a move that seemed decidedly spiteful, Agent Kish signed off by saying that he looked forward to seeing Dr. Long at Site-91. And not long after that, he did. 
Agent Kish, along with a huge number of agents and task force members from the Multi-U department arrived on site, bearing state-of-the-art containment equipment. An exasperated Dr. Long wasn't able to glean any more information from this experience. The Multi-U agents were ruthlessly efficient, transferring the lion's share of the anomalies into temporary containment and transporting them off-site within a few hours. By the time they were done, Dr. Long and his staff were left with one of the most desolate and empty containment sites on the Foundation's books. Here was Dr. Long, with decades of service and climbing the organizational ladder, only to be left as a glorified babysitter for a handful of low-priority anomalous items. It all felt like a cruel joke. After several days of nothing happening in the now incredibly uneventful Site-91, a bored Dr. Long reached out to a friend of his, researcher Nurul Shafike Binte Ahmad Ibrahim, whom he called by the nickname Shaq, to vent his frustrations. She commiserated, sharing her sympathy for his suddenly much less exciting working conditions, but saying that at least the job should be a little less lethal now. Shaq didn't know it yet, but on this particular point, she was terribly wrong. Dr. Long shared his theory that perhaps some sites were being consolidated so the Foundation could save money, and that this would lead to layoffs. Shaq essentially told him that he was worrying too much. The reality was that Dr. Long had some very good reasons to be worried. His problem was that he hadn't been worrying about the right things. In Foundation Containment Area 179, something awful was brewing. As usual, guards posted around SCP-2317, an old door containing a portal to another world, waited while Foundation staff and D-classes performed the standard Procedure 220 Calabasas ritual within. They were dealing with one of the most dangerous anomalies in the entire universe. But even then, after decades of service, one can be numb to such things. Suddenly, without warning, the door opened and a terrified Foundation researcher tumbled out, panting heavily, eyes bulging in existential horror. He screamed the words that he long hoped would never be spoken in his or even his children's lifetime. It happened! The chains have broken! The Devourer is free! The siren sounded, and an alert spread across the entire Foundation database. SCP-2317 is compromised. SCP-2317-K, the Devourer of Worlds is free. If the creature escapes Area 179, an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario is basically assured, so all efforts will be taken to make sure that the creature does not escape at any cost, and they really did mean any cost. The old wooden door of SCP-2317 splintered as an immense scaly hand sprang forth and caught a wave of devastation throughout the containment chamber. Guards were dispatched in the hundreds with heavy weaponry to buy some time, firing at the Devourer. A beast the size of a mountain rose from the ground, staring at the terrified humans below with its one gigantic red eye. It couldn't even feel the bullets, explosives, or incendiary and laser weaponry being used on it. The monster just shrugged it off and murdered nearly all of its attackers with one swipe of its claw. In a final desperate act hoping to kill or at least slow down the beast, staff at Area 179 made the ultimate sacrifice and detonated the entire on-site nuclear arsenal. The explosion disintegrated the entire facility in an instant and unleashed a radioactive shockwave that carried destruction for miles. But it wasn't enough. SCP-2317-K walked out of the mushroom cloud without a scratch on it, ready to show the human world what real destruction meant. At this point, the battle was already effectively lost, but the Foundation refused to go down without a fight. They dispatched all available mobile task forces, including Mobile Task Force New 7 Hammerdown, a heavily armed battalion strength task force created to combat the biggest and most extensive threats imaginable. And it wasn't even just the Foundation. True existential threats have a way of uniting people, as the GOC and even the Chaos Insurgency temporarily put aside their differences to take the fight to the Devourer. But would any of it be enough? Barrages of cruise missiles and ICBMs did nothing to halt the Devourer's assault, as it rampaged destroying towns and cities at first, then regions, then whole nations. Swarms of scrambled jets and helicopters were knocked out of the sky with casual swipes. The creature bulldozed over landscapes teeming with tanks and heavy artillery vehicles. It snapped aircraft carriers in half as it waded from ocean to ocean, systematically destroying everything in its path. Even satellite-mounted orbital cannons and the heavy energy weapons of MTF Tau-5, also known as Samsara, did nothing to phase the Devourer. 
It was finally coming to fruition. The dreaded XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, and none of the Foundation's expertise, advanced technology, or limitless resources could do anything to stop it. They aided in evacuation efforts, getting as many people as they could out of harm's way as the Devourer rampaged and destroyed, but even that was doing little more than borrowing time. Eventually, the Devourer would destroy all of them. There would be nothing left. And all Dr. James Long could do was watch helplessly from an almost empty Site-91, waiting for the tide of destruction to reach him. Of course, other Foundation employees, most prominently senior agents Sven Kish and the Multi-U department, had other concerns. All they needed to do was archive data for extraction. Extraction to where, you ask, seeing as the world seems to be at its end here? Well, Universe 7392 Epsilon Blue Lima, otherwise known as our universe, circa 1993. The Foundation works across the multiverse, and an XK-class end of the world scenario in one universe really isn't necessarily a problem in others. On orders of the O5 Council, Agent Kish and his men are charged with extracting data and valuable anomalies like SCP-173 from doomed universes. O5 knew that Dr. Long's universe, Universe 5643 Gamma Orange Delta, was due for an apocalyptic visit from the Devourer of Worlds any day now. That's why the Multi-U team went in to extract everything worth saving. Dr. Long and the millions of other Level 4 and below employees of that universe's foundation were never told of their impending doom. After all, that sort of thing could probably lead to unnecessary stress, and what they don't know won't hurt them, until, of course, it does. In 1993, these anomalous doomed universe SCPs were divided amongst our universe's various applicable containment sites. SCP-173, as you already know, ended up in Site-19, but sadly for the people working there, all the actual data files on this entry's file were lost in translation. So as far as they knew, 173 was little more than a big weird statue with apparently dangerous properties. Upon first placing it in its containment chamber in Site-19 Euclid Wing, Foundation legend Dr. Bright, unaware of just what he had here, assigned Dr. William Moto to begin research on the entity. He recommended that the researcher bring two D-classes for testing. When Dr. Moto was faced with the anomalous entity's blank file, he gave a sigh and began to write something in its description box. Move to Site-19, 1993. Origin is, as of yet, unknown. Wasn't that a delightful little tale? Now we know how SCP-173 made its way into Site-19, and what our own universe may have to look forward to in 2045. So remember, if you ever see Agent Sven Kish planning a transfer of anomalies out of your site, maybe consider using some of that PTO, and maybe consider putting a down payment on a nice, cozy apocalypse bunker over in Iceland. Know of other tales you'd like to see us cover? Let us know down in the comments below. It was quiet. Too quiet. That had been what everyone remembered about that day. Ask any member of personnel who was working what the one thing they recalled before it happened. They'd all tell you the same, that it had been too quiet. An eerie lull in the Foundation's usual day-to-day -day activity, followed by untold, unspeakable chaos. But the quiet had come first, and within that quiet, a madman was hiding. His name was Vince Barrett. At least, that was his legal name. But he much preferred to go by his online moniker of The Tainted Lizard, or just The Zard for short. Anyone who chooses to call themselves something like that in an attempt to sound cool might well be a person to avoid. And in Vince, sorry, the Zard's case, that sentiment was accurate. He was a social recluse, devoting a lot of his time to some of the darker corners of the internet. And we don't just mean that he spent his days trawling through Reddit. No, the Zard's interests were in the paranormal, the unusual and inexplicable, as well as the community of his fellow internet recluses dedicated to unearthing the true supernatural horrors of the world. Eventually spending so much time in corners of the online world where few normal people would dare to tread, that would lead to Zard becoming a member of the prolific forum known as Parawatch. This was the real deal. Not just urban legends and blurry photos of Bigfoot, or faked handheld videos of people falling into the back rooms. Parawatch had long been known to and kept under the surveillance of the SCP Foundation. Why? Well, because this infamous online message board would occasionally feature posts about anomalies. 
some even including SCPs and leaked information about the Foundation themselves. Of course, hardly any of these posts stayed up for very long, before the Foundation's tech team scrubbed them permanently. But it was here, on the Parawatch Forum, where Vince Barrett would encounter a fateful video clip. Acting fast, he managed to save the file before it was taken down. It was footage taken from the body cam of a Foundation security officer, during the midst of a containment breach. The Zard hit play, his hands shaking with excitement. The original poster of the clip to Parawatch had said that this footage was perhaps the only known video on the entire internet that depicted something known as SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile. Of course, those familiar with 682 and the SCP Foundation will need no introduction, but Vince, on the other hand, had only ever heard rumors about this creature. And now, in the video playing on his computer screen, he was seeing it for the first time. The reptile was free from its containment chamber, tearing its way through a Foundation facility, and making quick work of dispatching the security personnel that dared to stand in its way. It was a force of unbridled carnage and rage, destroying anything in its path and adapting to its environment. Deep in the Parawatch forum, the Zard had read rumors and leaks from alleged ex-Foundation staff and detractors that 682 was like something out of a nightmare. They said that the creature could adapt perfectly in response to damage inflicted upon it, or to changes in its environment, as well as heal any injury it sustained. It persisted, it kept on going, and something about that enamored Vince to the infamous anomaly. He thought it was beautiful, the ultimate apex predator, and admired the hard-to-destroy reptile's tenacity, as well as its ferocity. Watching the horrific containment breach footage, he realized then and there that he was a devoted fanatic of SCP-682. His time on the dark side of the web had twisted his mind and led him to make one fateful decision that he needed to see the creature in person. That had been almost a year earlier, and in the time since, the tainted lizard had pulled on every dark web string he knew of, eventually getting in contact with a shady group called the Chaos Insurgency. Vince had managed to get a hold of a real-life SCP Foundation keycard, as well as the location of the facility they were holding 682 in, and a forged transfer document. Posing as a humble, unassuming janitor, the Zard had made his way inside the Foundation, and wasted no time in making a beeline straight for the acid tank where 682 was held. He stared at the creature through the glass, eyes wide and jaws slacked in utter awe of the monstrous reptile. Perhaps the biggest fan of SCP-682 on the planet couldn't quite believe he was standing in the presence of the creature itself. It barely seemed to pay him any mind from the other side of the tank, the acid surrounding it melting 682 as fast as it could heal. Seeing it in containment enraged Vince. He hated that the Foundation had kept what he viewed as a perfect organism locked up after having tried time and time again to destroy it. Don't worry. The Zard murmured, approaching the tank well over the minimum safe distance. You're a force of unparalleled destruction, and you don't deserve to be here. I'm gonna set you free. Unfortunately, after the glass had been smashed and the alarm screamed out that another containment breach was occurring, Vince would quickly find out that the reptilian beast he revered so highly didn't quite hold him in the same regard. If you thought the Zard was going to make it all the way through the story alive, well, then we regret to inform you that you're sorely mistaken. Although not as woefully misguided as Vince himself, who was the first person in the path of SCP-682 when he freed the creature. What all those leaks and rumors on Parawatch had failed to mention about the heart to destroy reptile was its vehement and relentless hatred for all other forms of life including its very own fan. And the Tainted Lizard was only the first casualty of SCP-682's latest rampage. But this time was different. Sure, 682 was easily tearing its way through SCP Foundation personnel left and right. Security teams were flung aside and ripped to shreds as they tried in vain to recontain the monster. Research staff found themselves tripping over each other, trying to rush out of the destructive path of the hard-to-destroy reptile only to find themselves the next to face its ferocious attack. In other words, it seemed to mostly be another unbridled slaughter, common fare for an SCP-682 containment breach, except rather than breaking its way out of the facility. This particular instance saw the creature heading in the direction of another anomaly, SCP-914, better known as the Clockworks. 
Now, if a rampaging regenerative reptile on the loose wasn't enough cause for concern, then seeing it moving along its trajectory to another anomalous refinement machine certainly was. Those that had been on the other side of the facility when the dearly departed Zard set 682 free were now looking on in horror as the hard-to-destroy reptile burst into the room housing SCP-914. The Foundation staff, in the midst of panic, stared at security monitors with bated breath, palpable fear hanging in the air. Each and every one of them knew that SCP-682 was more than just a mindless beast. The creature was fiercely, frighteningly intelligent, sentient even. And as it approached the controls for the clockworks, every onlooker secretly hoped something or someone would step in at the last second and prevent SCP-682 from entering the machine. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. SCP-914 whirred into life its gears and gyros spinning as SCP-682 entered the input booth. Now, normally the way the clockworks operates is by destroying any item placed within it and replacing it with something else in the output booth. Depending on its setting, it either completely disintegrates an item, breaks down an object into its base components, replaces it with an equivalent, or improves it. And being set to very fine as it was right now, SCP-914 can even add anomalous properties to whatever is put inside of it. But what happens when an indestructible and infinitely adaptable monstrosity is in the clockworks? Well, it can't destroy and recreate a better version of something that would be known for being hard to destroy, can it? The entire machine was going haywire. SCP-682 was adapting to the refinement process, refusing to let SCP-914 unmake it, even to replace it with an improved version of itself. The hard-to-destroy reptile and the clockworks were at a momentary stalemate and watched with bated breath by the Foundation. SCP-914 began to malfunction, its clockwork components getting stuck as if the machine was jammed. Its cogs were clogged up, unable to destroy the subject in the input booth. The room around was beginning to shake. In fact, the very ground was trembling at the force of the whole machine shuddering. Enact the Abandon All Hope Protocol, the head of research said desperately, watching the events unfold from the other side of the building. The site director looked at them and nodded, the pair of them entering their secure passcodes to activate this secretive security measure. Just as they did, a small earthquake erupted underfoot. The entire wing of the facility housing the clockworks and SCP-682 had collapsed into the ground. A huge crater was all that remained, littered with wreckage of a whole portion of the Foundation site, along with broken pieces of SCP-914. For the next few minutes, everyone was on edge, secretly hoping that SCP-682 hadn't survived. Maybe the clockworks had managed to destroy it, but the sheer force of doing so had caused the machine to collapse in on itself. Or perhaps the hard-to-destroy reptile was now buried beneath several thousand tons of debris, dead at long last. But the Foundation staff knew better than to get their hopes up. And sure enough, just as an armed security team approached the crater, something started stirring in the rubble. Suddenly, SCP-682 came bursting out of the crater, emerging in not quite the same state, although no less deadly than before. The clockworks hadn't been able to unmake the hard-to-destroy reptile, but the resultant malfunction and explosion had imbued the creature with a whole host of new anomalous abilities. It still resembled its old self, but was now more humanoid, standing bipedal instead of on all fours. Some of its body mass had seemingly been reduced due to damage sustained in the malfunction, although SCP-682 was still plenty of feet taller than an ordinary human being. In fact, it could be any height it needed to be. The creature's scaly skin seemed to be shifting unnaturally, moving of its own accord, like it was already preparing to adapt to oncoming damage. And as the nearby security team were about to find out, this made it even deadlier than before. In a panic, the Foundation officers opened fire, only to find that their weapons weren't operating the way they should. Something caused excitation of the copper shells of their bullets, making them either expand and block the barrels of their guns, or causing them to backfire horribly, injuring the security personnel wielding them. Before anybody could even call in air support or heavy artillery as a backup, a number of the Foundation's most powerful weapons suffered even more catastrophic misfires. Missiles detonated early. They hadn't even been aimed at SCP-682 yet, but they would have been. Instead, they exploded, taking with them a huge number of Foundation entities. 
some miles away from where the newly refined reptile now stood. SCP-682's regenerative powers had been altered by the clockworks. It wasn't purely reactive to oncoming damage now, it was preemptive. It could adapt to attacks that hadn't even happened yet. With no way of stopping it, SCP-682 began decimating everything in its path with greater ferocity than ever. Over the coming days, the newly dubbed Impossible to Destroy Reptile began its biggest rampage yet, entering a permanent rage state and unleashing destruction on a global scale. It stormed through cities and wiped out entire major population centers in moments. It seemed nothing on Earth could stand against the refined reptile, fueled by its singular mission to wipe out all life in existence. The surviving personnel of the SCP Foundation soon came to learn that no damage could be inflicted on the creature whatsoever. SCP-682 could predict attacks ahead of the person that would carry it out, and then adapt, changing the very world around it so that attack never came. The impossible to destroy reptiles adaptations usually took the form of diverting any oncoming damage it preempted it would take, and instead inflicted that same damage on whoever it chose. Even though the machine had malfunctioned, the clockworks had made SCP-682 that good at adapting to its surroundings that the creature had almost become a universal constant. The fact that it could not be harmed now seemed to be as fundamental of a law as that of gravity. But that wasn't going to stop the SCP Foundation from trying. The number of casualties the world over had been increasing steadily day by day, as SCP-682 continued its devastating campaign of slaughter. Some of the remaining scraps of the Foundation had tried to subdue the creature, but any attempts at fighting it with conventional weapons were ill-advised, to say the least. After all, how do you fight against a creature that can predict your every move and counter them before you've even thought of those moves? Well, you can try throwing something so unexpected at it. At least pulling something out of left field means that the chances of SCP-682 seeing it coming are slightly slimmer. And that was where the Abandon All Hope Protocol came in. You see, the Foundation had been anticipating that 682 would one day become too powerful to contain long before the creature had gained its new ability to preemptively adapt. And while the worldwide death toll had climbed from hundreds of thousands of innocent people to the earliest millions, an unlikely counterattack was brewing. One so unexpected that even the impossible to destroy reptile would struggle to see it coming. Just as humanity was facing the brink of extinction, the Foundation dispatched their last hope at stopping SCP-682, other SCPs. The Abandon All Hope Protocol had been devised for when the suffering and destruction caused by SCP-682 became so great that there were no other options left. When it had been activated, Foundation agents stationed at various sites across the world had gathered a specially selected group of anomalies. Each one was chosen because they were known to be sympathetic towards humanity, or at least be coerced into taking on SCP-682. And now, these SCPs were stepping up to the plate, ready to fight the impossible to destroy reptile, or more likely, to die trying. SCP-076-2, the immortal warrior known as Abel, was infamous for picking fights. The ancient Sumerian swordsman had a penchant for seeking out the most challenging adversaries, so convincing him to take a crack at SCP-682 wasn't all that difficult. However, rushing into battle against the refined reptile, Abel quickly found he couldn't draw his weapons from his pocket dimension. They were dissipating the moment his fingers touched them, vanishing faster than he could draw. No matter, the warrior thought. He'd been alive for centuries and thus had become a master in every form of hand-to-hand -hand combat. As you can imagine, he didn't last very long, left to slowly revive inside his stone tomb after SCP-682 had finished dispatching him. Abel's brother Cain incurred a slightly different result when he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the impossible to destroy reptile. SCP-073 was hardly the fighter his brother was, but had the anomalous trait of reflecting incoming damage back at whoever was inflicting it on him. So when SCP-682 attacked Cain, theoretically the same attack would have bounced back and harmed the reptile itself. And before, that's what would have happened. But now SCP-682 could adapt preemptively, a strange never-before-seen phenomenon occurred. It appeared that neither SCP-073 nor the refined reptile were harming each other at all. However, on a metaphysical level, 
the potential damage of 682's attacks against Kane were being reflected back towards the reptile, only for the creature to preemptively adapt to the damage from its own attack being inflicted back. What resulted was a feedback loop of perpetual possible damage that ended only when Kane eventually passed out from shock. Unfortunately, while he could reflect damage back at an attacker, he felt the pain of every hit, and SCP-682 had more than just a mean right hook. The Foundation had hoped, given its 100% mortality record, that SCP-096 would have no trouble killing the impossible-to-destroy reptile, or at the very least harming it enough so that it could be subdued. After all, 682 still needed to see, and anyone looking at the Shy Guy quickly met their end. But when the tall, pale humanoid approached SCP-682, something unusual happened. The reptile could look at SCP-096, able to see it perfectly. Perhaps the creature's adaptive properties were creating an intentional blind spot in its vision, removing SCP-096 from view. Or maybe 682 no longer saw with just eyes, perceiving the world in a manner far beyond our understanding of basic sight. But whatever the case, the impossible to destroy reptile made SCP-096 turn and flee in terror. Compelled to put an end to the reptile's reign of terror, SCP-4494, the Spectre, manifested nearby and tried to intervene. The result was nothing short of brutal. A one-sided fight that not even the living embodiment of crime fighting could hope to win. After SCP-682 had finished off the Spectre, a strange black fluid began oozing from nearby. Although one of the hardest to wrangle, the Foundation believed that they had convinced SCP-106 to aid in taking down SCP-682. The old man emerged from the oily secretion, shuffling menacingly towards the impossible-to-destroy reptile. It seemed to freeze as if it was taking a defensive stance against the old man, either that or tricking him into getting closer. Before he could even reach out a decrepit hand to touch the reptile's shifting skin, SCP-106 was suddenly coated in copious amounts of the black substance he secreted. It coated him like thick tar. The more his decaying body produced, the more he was covered in it. Normally, he was resistant to the corrosive burning effects of this substance, However, SCP-682's preemptive adaptation powers had caused SCP-106 to overproduce the oily substance, enough to rapidly dissolve the old man into a steaming black puddle. It was at this point that SCP-343, colloquially known as God, lowered his newspaper and looked out of his window. That is to say, he looked out of the huge hole that had been left in the wall of his cell. Being omniscient, SCP-343 was already burdened with the awareness of what had happened. SCP-682 had been refined into an even worse version of itself by the clockworks. Up until now, God had been happy to avoid all the fighting and just see how everything worked out. But as much as he tried to distract himself, SCP-682 slaughtering other SCPs in droves was getting in the way of his reading. Oh, this again. In a split second, the entire universe had been unmade and then remade almost exactly the same. Except SCP-343 had made a slight adjustment, giving a little nudge to cause and effect in a few places. As a result, a certain misguided forum user had never and would never infiltrate the Foundation and break SCP-682 free, leading to the hard-to-destroy reptile being refined by the clockworks. Although, while it had been unceremoniously returned to its original form and placed back in its acid tank, SCP-682 could still remember the power it had wielded only moments before everything had been rewritten. All it needed was another chance to get into the clockworks. SCP-096, the Shy Guy, woke up in an unfamiliar room without a thought in its head. However, one thing quickly occurred to it. This was not its containment chamber. No, the solid steel cube that had kept it locked up for decades now didn't have a front desk or walls covered in strange childlike murals or tinny party music playing over old speakers. Wherever SCP-096 had found itself, it certainly wasn't the place it had come to call home. If it could read, it would have registered the words behind the front desk, painted onto the wall, Ban Ban's Kindergarten, where joy comes alive. Little did 096 know, something really did come to life here at Ban Ban's Kindergarten, but it definitely wasn't joy. 
SCP-096 was typically used to a much more confined space, so presented with so much strange freedom, its natural instinct was to wander around, whimpering quietly to itself. This place was certainly peculiar, with multiple large reinforced doors, each one having a large red button fixed to the wall above them. A strange green creature was painted on the wall, with an affixed speech bubble that read, Jumbo Josh says, eat fruits and vegetables if you want to be strong like me. Though 096 paid no mind to such things. This place looked like an SCP Foundation containment facility, mixed with an off-brand Chuck E. Cheese, and some tiny part of the Shy Guy's dim and dismal brain wanted to see more of it. What other secrets could it hold? The Shy Guy pressed one of the big red buttons, causing the doors to open underneath it. There was a faint sound of childish laughter somewhere down the distant hall. How had it ever found its way into such a strange place? The deeper the Shy Guy wandered, the more strange murals it saw on the wall. There was one for a large orange cartoon jellyfish with one staring eye, where the speech bubble read, Stinger Flynn says, Having many arms allows me to help a lot of people. Then, a squat blue gorilla-like creature with sharp lower teeth had a speech bubble that read, Captain Fiddles says, Ooga Booga Booga Ooga. A white feminine cat-like creature had the speech bubble, Bambolina says, Kindness is free, so sprinkle it everywhere. A misshapen pink bird creature had the speech bubble, Opila Bird says, Laughter is the best medicine, so make sure to smile. And of course, most importantly of all, presiding over the creativity room was a mural of a grinning red creature wearing a pair of party hats on its head like horns. His speech bubble read, Ban Ban says, sharing is caring, your pancreas is mine. A whiteboard not far from this mural had the words, run for your lives, hastily scrawled onto it. To anyone but the shy guy who had no point of reference, this was clearly not a normal kindergarten. As the shy guy passed into the hallway, slowly lumbering along, it suddenly felt an intense spike of burning pain right through its forehead. Rising like a fever pitch, the shy guy's subdued whimpers quickly escalated into horrifying wails of animalistic rage. This could only mean one thing. Somewhere, something had made the terrible mistake of gazing at the shy guy's face. In fact, not ten feet away, the unfortunate Opala bird had made that very mistake. It typically peeked out from behind one of the hallway's pillars to get a good look at any potential intruders, or new prey wandering into its midst. But this time, the beastly bird's curiosity had taken it from predator to prey itself. Though it wouldn't realize this until it was already too late. As the mutant bird creature skittered back into the cavernous hall filled with plastic trees and an underwhelming play area, the shy guy came galloping after it on all fours, roaring with fury. The Opala bird was shocked to see the creature giving chase. This doesn't make sense. I'm meant to chase you. You're not meant to chase me. But things are rarely fair when it comes to the shy guy. Arguably one of the most dangerous Euclid-class creatures ever kept in Foundation containment. The Opala bird flapped desperately towards the boarded-up escape hatch, but the shy guy was so much faster. It grabbed hold of the bird gripping it in its iron clutches and began to stretch open its bottom jaw with a blood-curdling roar. We'll spare you the details of what happened next, but suffice to say, little more than a handful of feathers were left. After finishing off the Opala bird, the shy guy reverted from rage back to pitiful sadness. This place was no better than the SCP Foundation. There were still creatures here to look at its face and drive it into a state of extreme emotional distress. It was horrible. The shy guy needed to find a way to hide himself away again, so he decided to tear away the planks covering up the escape hatch and lope down the narrow hall. In there, the shy guy actually found something to its liking. Two platforms, one on either side of the room, with what seemed to be a deep, dark chasm between the two. For most, there was an electrical lift system for carrying them between the platforms, but the shy guy had no interest in the platforms. He only sought the darkness below, where nobody could see his face. That would suit him just fine. The shy guy jumped over the guardrail and plummeted down below into the dark. Feeling the air against its cold gray skin as it fell felt wonderful. It dared to think that it might even find solace in this deep, dark place, but as soon as he hit something solid, 
some kind of metal lift system, alarms went off, and flashing red lights soon made everything down there in the darkness visible. To be exposed like this while it thought it was hidden was the dreaded Shy Guy's worst nightmare. Little did he know, he would soon become the worst nightmare of a number of other beasts. As the Shy Guy crawled off the metal platform, hoping that perhaps it could find another place to hide down here. Its hands and feet splashed into shallow water. Had something sprung a leak down here? The Shy Guy began wandering the half-dark as the water of this flooded sub-basement area pooled around him. It had no idea that another creature was already sneaking up behind it, getting ready to strike. Before 096 could even react, several whip-like orange tentacles wrapped around its limbs and began delivering an antagonizing shock through its body. More tentacles came in soon after, wrapping around the Shy Guy's body and face, delivering shock after shock after shock with its millions of tiny, venomous stinger barbs. For a second it seemed like the surprise attack might actually be able to subdue the monster, but little did the Shy Guy's attacker, the monstrous real Stinger Flynn, know that attacking it was just another way to activate its infamous rage state. The second that Stinger Flynn relented, even just for a moment, the Shy Guy grabbed him by the tentacles and slammed him into the watery floor, again and again and again, until the grip of his tentacles loosened around the Shy Guy's body and he was defenseless. With Stinger panicked and immobilized, the Shy Guy released the full force of his supernatural fury, striking the demonic jellyfish with his fists until what was left couldn't be distinguished from the water it used to be floating in. Stinger Flynn had been completely annihilated. The Shy Guy once again temporarily returned to a state of calm and wandered out of this watery basement into a nearby hallway where everything was bright and dry. The walls were painted in garish, childlike drawings of a jungle with janky-looking animals. The Shy Guy paid no mind to any of it. All he wanted was to find somewhere that he could actually be alone, and away from prying eyes of all these freaks. This dream was short-lived, because as soon as the Shy Guy found a new room, a wide-open auditorium filled with inflatable jungle trees, like a crude play area, he was being stalked yet again. A powerful, muscular predator, with veins stretching over its bulging muscles and blue skin. It knew that this intruder had already killed two of its fellow garden dwellers, but this time, it would put this spindly, pale stranger in its place. The Shy Guy heard something rumbling towards it from behind, and turned upon hearing the blood-curdling war cry of Ooga Booga Booga Ooga. It was the gorilla-like Captain Fiddles, with strands of saliva hanging from his tusks. He leaped onto the Shy Guy and began pounding into its hideous face with his huge blue fists. Captain Fiddles would destroy the Shy Guy, pound him into the concrete until he stopped moving. The one thing that Captain Fiddles didn't expect was for the Shy Guy to start fighting back. And he was about to learn the hard truth that the Shy Guy could fight a lot harder than him. The SCP's spindly but immensely powerful arms grabbed Captain Fiddles by the shoulders and threw him into the wall, causing huge cracks to crawl up towards the ceiling. Before Captain Fiddles could even think about wrenching himself free, the Shy Guy leaped to his feet and bounded over to him. The Shy Guy grabbed Captain Fiddles by the ankles and ripped him out of the wall, letting his body drop to the floor and then unleashing hell upon him. Captain Fiddles would have begged for mercy if he wasn't already dead. Before the Shy Guy could even begin to calm down, a trapdoor opened in the floor beneath him, dropping him into a new area, a multicolored maze where 096 was trapped like a helpless rat, with the body count of an atomic bomb. Once again, the Shy Guy didn't need to go looking for trouble, because trouble was already on its way. The pure white, cat-like Bambolina pounced from a sharp corner in the maze, claws bared. She jumped onto the Shy Guy, latching onto him and clawing, trying to scratch his nightmare of a face. If the Shy Guy had ever possessed anything resembling patience, it would have run out long before now. He grabbed Bambolina, shrugging off the pain of her claws and tossing her into the darkness high above. She flew off with a cat-like yell and hit some distant ceiling with a crunch. Suffice to say, she wouldn't be back to bother the Shy Guy again. Tired and angry, the pale abomination didn't feel like wandering through a maze. Instead, it just charged straight through, destroying colorful wall after colorful wall. When it encountered whatever was behind this extremely frustrating afternoon, it would destroy it with extreme prejudice. 
That was almost certainty. After breaking through one more wall, the shy guy tumbled out into a strange room, where a grinning red creature was waiting for him. Wearing two party hats on top of his head, this was no mere lackey, it was Ban Ban himself, the one behind this nightmarish kindergarten. He stared right into the shy guy's face with no fear at all, almost like he knew something that the shy guy didn't. And it was true, he had no plan to fight the shy guy himself, he'd brought a champion with him. As the shy guy started to scream in rage, all the boxes behind Ban Ban tumbled out of the way as a huge figure rose. A behemoth at least 50 feet tall, with green skin, giant teeth, and huge staring eyes. It was Jumbo Josh, and if the shy guy wanted to graduate from this nightmare kindergarten, it would need to defeat him and Ban Ban. The shy guy growled, digging its claws into the ground and preparing to charge forward. Challenge accepted. Dr. Bradshaw had only been working at the SCP Foundation for a few years, but in that time he had seen things that had changed him irreparably. Ancient texts about world-ending abominations, machines that could spontaneously produce any food or drink from nowhere, friendly slime monsters with a penchant for tickling, invisible kleptomaniac women and wannabe heroic men covered in spikes. But one anomaly in particular stuck with him, haunted his dreams, and dominated his waking thoughts. SCP-049, that mysterious masked doctor with his deadly touch and strange beaked visage trying in vain to cure something he would only refer to as, quote, the pestilence and, quote, the great dying. His cure was more like a curse, it seemed, as his unusual treatments transformed his patients into the mindless living dead, shuffling around as malformed shells of their former selves. If this was the cure, Dr. Bradshaw found himself often wondering, what was the disease? Many researchers had attempted to get to the bottom of this question over the years, interviewing SCP-049 and nurturing their own pet theories in their free time but none had ever received a satisfying answer, ever reached a real conclusion. It was this legacy of fruitless hypothesizing and questioning that led Dr. Bradshaw to pitch his own plan for unmasking the pestilence once and for all. He would gather every prominent theory his colleagues could come up with, including several of his own. Then he would simply engage the Plague Doctor in polite discourse, walking him through each theory one by one and waiting to see if any of them stuck. It took Dr. Bradshaw weeks to collect and distill the theories down into a workable list of questions, consolidating those that overlapped and eliminating those that were simply ridiculous, such as Dr. Bright's potentially facetious insistence that the pestilence was lactose intolerance. But when the day came, he felt ready to take on the task. When the interview was through, perhaps he would have managed to do what none before him at the Foundation had. Perhaps he would understand what the Plague Doctor was fighting with his unorthodox methods, and by extension, how they could pacify him non-lethally once and for all. Dr. Bradshaw held his notebook tight as he made the long walk down the hall from his office to SCP-049's containment chamber. This was it, the moment of truth, he hoped. He had asked his colleagues to pump the scent of lavender into 049's room to put him at ease, as well as give him his dinner just in time for the meeting. He hoped that the meal, a little glass of wine, and the peaceful atmosphere would make the Plague Doctor more amenable to his line of questioning. SCP-049 was sitting in front of the wide glass window, fork and knife in hand, when Dr. Bradshaw arrived. Hello, Doctor. Bradshaw gave 049 a wave. Ah, good evening. They told me I would be having company for dinner. But where's your food, sir? Oh, I'm, I'm not hungry. Dr. Bradshaw brushed him off politely. No sense. It would be horribly rude for me to eat while you have nothing. Excuse me, he called to a guard nearby. Please bring this man a helping of what you've served me so we may dine together. With a sigh, Dr. Bradshaw nodded at the guard, giving him permission to do what the plague doctor asked. A few moments later, he too had a tray with a plate of fish and roasted vegetables and a small cup of wine on the side. Now, may I ask you some questions? The plague doctor nodded. Indeed. What is it that I can do for you? I was hoping you could teach me more about the pestilence. Dr. Bradshaw began delicately. The plague doctor perked up. Have you come to assist me with my work? 
my dear fellow, why did you not say so from the start? It would be my honor to provide you with all the knowledge I possess on this subject, if you intend to lend a hand. I just want to understand more about it first, Dr. Bradshaw said. It wasn't quite a lie, not really. He did want to understand. He flipped open his notebook, scanning the page for the first of the posited theories he had gathered. Is it possible that what you refer to the pestilence, you're talking about pain as a whole? The plague doctor cocked his head to the side. Uh, what do you mean? Well, you once described SCP-096 as being afflicted with an extreme case of the pestilence, I believe. And when you cure someone, they're no longer able to feel any pain, physical or emotional. I know that you mean well, but is it possible that's what you're trying to treat? The pain that naturally afflicts all human life, most living things? The plague doctor scoffed. You think that I, a physician, am so ignorant of pain? That I would misdiagnose agonies as something so devastating as a great dying? If you are here to insult me, sir, I will simply ask that you leave. I'm sorry, that was not my intention. Please, let me stay. I promise I'm only here to try and understand. Will you withhold judgment until I'm finished? One man of science to another? The plague doctor paused, mulling this over. He nodded. I will hear your questions and do my best to answer them. Thank you. Dr. Bradshaw smiled and returned to his notes. So, you have been in the field of medicine for quite some time, and I imagine you've studied a variety of sciences. You work with a lot of liquids and substances none of us have ever encountered before. Were they the result of alchemy? Used to balance the humors of your patients? I was curious if your treatments and if the pestilence itself is thaumaturgical in nature. That is to say, well, magical. The plague doctor let out a sharp laugh at this. <laughs> Magic! <laughs> Sir, I am no magician, nor am I an alchemist, as I have never formally studied alchemy in any form. The humors, of course, must be balanced for proper health, but that has nothing to do with alchemy, in my opinion. How is your black vial? You appear to have an excess of it. Do you experience a great deal of stomach pain? Dr. Bradshaw rushed to steer the topic away from him and his health, lest the plague doctor offer to treat him. Mm, not particularly. Next question. His eyes returned to his notes. Uh, let's see. We've noticed that you seem to cure those who are most afraid of death and dying, and when you first arrived at our facility, you stated that there was less pestilence here than other places you had been. Most of our staff have seen enough death and misfortune that it no longer frightens us. We're inoculated against it, essentially. One researcher working with you was afraid of death at first, but as he came to accept it as an inevitability, you said that he was no longer infected. Is the pestilence fear itself? Or more specifically, the fear of death? The plague doctor mulled this over. One's outlook, one's attitude can impact their health. It is easier to fight a disease when one does not let fear take over. But other than that, I'm afraid I do not understand your question. The pestilence is simply what it is. Why are you more preoccupied with categorizing it than curing it? I believe that to understand something is to know how to fight it, Dr. Bradshaw answered simply. Mm, we may differ there, but you may continue. I'm grateful for the company and for your desire to understand, mm, misguided though it may be. Thank you, Doctor. I wanted to ask you, are you familiar with the Scarlet King? The Plague Doctor's expression did not change. I have seen the rise and fall of many monarchs in my time. Why would you ask me about this Scarlet King? That wasn't a no. Well, Dr. Bradshaw began, according to legend, one of his many daughters was Pestilence, a bringer of disease and destruction. Is she the one you intend to fight? I know not every single form the Pestilence takes. Only the grip it has on this world. SCP-049 answered, For your sake, I would advise you to avoid speaking of such matters. That king he is not a thing you wish to face. Dr. Bradshaw jotted down a quick note in the margin of the page. Scarlet King connection possible. Then he returned to his line of questioning. Have you spoken with SCP-343? I have. The plague doctor nodded. And what did he tell you? It is not worth going into here. According to him, the pestilence that you refer to is humanity's free will. You were changed by something a long time ago, a tragedy that turned you towards your work. You came from a dark place, one of the places even 343 can't see. Is that true? I will not answer that question. It is an insult, SCP-049 said. Again, not a no exactly. 
But still, Dr. Bradshaw did not want to push too hard, too soon, and risk the doctor terminating their conversation. My apologies, I'll shift to something different. You once treated the bubonic plague, correct? SCP-049 shook his head. No, I am not familiar with that particular condition. Dr. Bradshaw had prepared for this. He pulled a medical illustration from his notebook, depicting a victim of the Black Plague. Uh, what about something like this? SCP-049 sighed. Ah, now this ailment I have encountered before. I did my best to treat it, but it was stubborn. Is it related to the pestilence? Dr. Bradshaw asked. Not necessarily. 049 said nothing more than that. He took a sip of wine, ate a bite of potato. He wasn't going to offer any more insight into that particular theory, it seemed. I mean no offense with this next question, but Doctor, have you always lived here? On this planet? Or did you make your way here from another world of some kind? Perhaps the pestilence came from wherever you did. The world has changed around me a great deal in my life. SCP-049 said, But I have always been here, at least as best as I can recall. He seemed to be telling the truth, but with that unmoving, inscrutable expression, it was difficult to be sure. This next theory would be extremely difficult to float without offending 049, but Dr. Bradshaw had to try. He needed to do his due diligence. Are you familiar with the story of Typhoid Mary? He would ease into the idea. That would probably be best. I am not. SCP-049 sounded puzzled. She was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid, Dr. Bradshaw explained. As others grew sick around her, she remained healthy and well. She had no idea that as she worked as a cook in the houses of wealthy families, she was infecting them with a deadly disease. It was not any moral failing of her own. She didn't understand what she was doing, but she still spread the virus throughout her community. Stop right there. The plague doctor's tone was stern tense. I know what you are suggesting, and it offends me to my core. If you do not see these file implications, I will be forced to end our talk here and now. I am a physician, sir. I do not endanger my patients so recklessly. I understand. Better to leave that theory alone for now. You said that you have always been here, but I do have to ask, have you ever heard of a place called Alagara? There are those that claim you once lived there, that you came from that kingdom. I have never heard that name that I can recall, but I have lived a long life. Perhaps I have forgotten. What nation does that belong to? Dr. Bradshaw paused. It was his turn to be stumped. I'm not sure. Do you know who the Black Lord is? He couldn't be certain, but he thought he saw SCP-049 frown. Villain. A villain. He grumbled under his breath. I banish him from my thoughts, that he may never again enter my sight. His gloved hands clenched into fists, and Dr. Bradshaw jotted down another note in the margins, the Black Lord. He had devoted plenty of time to everyone else's theories. It was time for one that he had been earnestly considering. Doctor, it is my opinion that the pestilence may be connected to emotional state or heart rate, perhaps both. When you treat your patients, do you remove the heart or the amygdala to address those issues? I've noticed heart removal during a handful of your procedures. You have a keen eye, SCP-049 enthused. However, I do not always remove the heart. It varies greatly from patient to patient, you see. For some, the heart is a crucial part of the infection. For others, it impacts the brain. Others steal the liver or the larger nervous system. That is why it is so difficult to treat, you see. It can manifest in seemingly infinite ways. But what about emotions? Negative impulses, cruelty, selfishness, hatred. Is that a component? I was reviewing your file and you mentioned an excess of the pestilence in the home of a wealthy man known for exploiting his workers and mistreating his family. When you were cross-tested with SCP-682, you remarked that the pestilence did not only impact humans, suggesting the anomaly was also infected, and you cured your patients while well, they don't seem to have a hateful impulse in their bodies. Ah. Hate can be a disease. The plague doctor took another bite of food, chewing slowly. When he swallowed, Dr. Bradshaw expected him to elaborate on this thought, but he didn't. So, Dr. Bradshaw broke the silence. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, the ones that bring about the end of the world. War, famine, death, and 
pestilence. There have been stories about them for thousands of years. Do you know pestilence personally? Are you protecting us from him from the end of days? SCP-049 scoffed. I work in science, not stories. I intend no disrespect to your beliefs, but surely you hear how absurd that sounds. Pestilence does not ride in on a horse. It resides in the body. You've lost patients before, haven't you? Every physician has if what they are treating is severe. It never gets any easier to do so, I'm sure. Have you ever lost someone special to you, though? Done something you truly regret? Perhaps the pestilence was a manifestation of some guilt or trauma, some shame he could never truly let go. Every man has regrets. Do you not have those secret shames, Doctor? Dr. Bradshaw changed the subject. I have always wondered this. Can you see the misdeeds that someone has done? Can you somehow sense the sins of their past, all the harm they have caused? Why do you ask? SCP-049 cocked his head again. Are you afraid I can see something within you? He couldn't explain why, but the question made his stomach turn. No, he answered. It was a lie. Will everyone catch the pestilence eventually? As time goes on, the odds do become greater, yes. But not everyone is doomed. Is that it? Is it time? The passage of time, aging, decay, the great dying, you called it. So is it dying itself? Your cured patients, they don't age. They never decay any more than they already have. Death is not natural, SCP-049 simply said. All things die eventually, Dr. Bradshaw argued. I have not died yet. SCP-049 took a drink of wine. Well, there was no arguing with that. Something else I've been thinking about is the possibility that the pestilence is greater than just one thing. Dr. Bradshaw began his next theory. Doctors believed at one time that the plague was caused by an imbalance of the humors in the body. They could recognize the presence of disease, but couldn't routinely tell them all apart. Several different illnesses were referred to as consumption, and leprosy was used as a catch-all for multiple illnesses as well. Clearly, you have a knack for knowing when someone is ill, but what if it's something else? Something equally bad, but different from what you think. It's cancer, or a stroke, or a heart condition. There is no one cure except for the massive transformational work you're already doing. Hmm, possible. SCP-049 mused. I will need to consider that point carefully. Perhaps you have unlocked a secret to the pestilence I missed. Then again, perhaps not. If the pestilence is not death, then I do have to wonder, is it the opposite? Life is a temporary state for so many of us less lucky than you, and it seems like you cure your patients of natural life when you treat them. They become something not quite dead, but not quite living, at least not as they were. And illness, ailments, hurt, all comes as a natural side effect of being alive. So is the great dying life itself? I do not understand the question, and thus I will not respond to it, SCP-049 stated. Dr. Bradshaw could sense that the plague doctor was growing frustrated, getting tired of so many questions that poked at his beliefs, his research, and his process. Is the pestilence natural or something man-made? Humans have created diseases before, caused them to mutate or worsen them with chemicals we invent. Have you heard of Agent Orange? I don't mean to digress, but my point is, it's not unheard of for people to be responsible for a disease. I wonder, is the pestilence something that developed on its own? Or is it our doing? A biological weapon, a synthesized virus, or artificial mutation created by other scientists? Or maybe. Dr. Bradshaw paused here, referring once more to his notes. Is it sin? Greed, lust, wrath, pride, envy, gluttony, sloth. Maybe not that biblical, that exact, but is it evil? The sort of thing that rots away at a human soul. Not a plague of the body, but of the very essence, and the only way to cure it is to rip the whole thing out and start over. You seem to have the answers in mind before you ask me these questions, Doctor. I will allow you one more before I take my leave. I have found this whole ordeal quite exhausting. Dr. Bradshaw nodded. Okay, just one more. Is it something unnatural, not man-made, not of nature, viruses, or bacteria, but something else altogether? Something from another dimension, another world, or the spaces in between. You have been cagey about the nature of the pestilence for as long as you have been here, and I understand if you are just being cautious, but I can't help but wonder if there is something else to the reason you keep so much to yourself. You promised to tell me about the pestilence, but you've barely responded to most of my questions except to dismiss my ideas. 
Is the pestilence something that spreads by thought, that lives in the consciousness or the subconscious of us all, waiting, dormant, for something to activate it and set the sickness free? The plague doctor set down his fork with a clatter. I respect your scientific curiosity, but there are things I cannot share with you. For my safety, for yours, for everyone's, do take care, doctor. You too. Dr. Bradshaw stood from his chair, collecting his notes and preparing to leave. One final thing. Dr. Bradshaw turned back to face the plague doctor. Yes? Those dark eyes watched him from inside the mask. Do you see any of the pestilence in me? The silence that passed between them felt like an eternity. Then, SCP-049 spoke. No, sir, I do not. But one day, that could change. As Dr. Bradshaw made his way back to his office, the words echoed in his mind, and he couldn't make up his mind whether they were comforting or troubling. He had gone into the meeting with questions, but now he had even more than he started with. Ever since she was in high school, Faith had dreamed of moving out and finally getting a place of her own. It wasn't that she didn't love her parents. She did, but they were always around, always coming into her room without knocking, telling her when to go to bed, when to wake up, not to eat dinner in front of the TV. In college, she had some welcome independence, but she had to live with roommates. Again, they were perfectly nice people. Some of them she even considered good friends, but she hated having to share her space, having to come home from a long day of classes and see someone else's dishes piled up in the sink, to have someone else's music keeping her awake at night, to delay her morning shower because someone else had gotten there first. So she was thrilled when a few years after graduating, she got a new job at a marketing company that would finally let her afford a place by herself. At last, she could have some peace, some quiet, and most importantly, some privacy. Faith spent all day moving furniture and unpacking boxes, turning the little apartment into a real home. It wasn't much, just a main room she used as a bedroom and living room, a bathroom, and a basic little kitchen. But it was all hers, and all of the little personal touches she'd put together really made it feel like the place was meant for her. There was the orange couch she'd picked up at a vintage store downtown, the coffee table she'd gotten for free from her last roommate, framed pictures of her family and friends, a bed with linens in her favorite color, light blue, and lots and lots of potted plants. Over time, she would find even more things, more little personal touches to liven up the space, now, how to celebrate her new home? Her gas wasn't on yet, so she couldn't cook anything, but that was the perfect excuse to order in. 30 minutes or less later, she was kicking back on her couch with a large cheese pizza, watching a scary movie on her TV. No one would ask to switch it over to The Bachelor. No one would take the last slice while she was in the bathroom. It was perfect. Finally, a little piece of heaven, an introvert's paradise. As she finished her first meal in the new place, she felt her eyes beginning to grow heavy, the day of strenuous unpacking catching up with her body. Just as she was thinking about calling it a night, a pale-faced monster appeared out of nowhere on screen, terrifying the movie's main character and making Faith jump, spilling her soda all over the coffee table. Damn it! She groaned. Already she'd made a mess, but hey, she tried to look on the bright side. It was yet another first to break in the apartment. She grabbed a kitchen towel to mop up the soda, and when she returned to the main room, she froze. There was something in the window, standing out against the darkness outside. At first, she thought it was a reflection, a trick of the light, but as she slowly approached the window, eyes wide and hands trembling, she got a better look. There was a face, a little difficult to make out, as if it were peering out of the shadows, but unmistakable nonetheless. It was pale, human, vaguely resembling a strange man with dark circles under his eyes, and he was looking right at her. She didn't scream. She was too terrified to make a sound. She stared at the face for a long moment, waiting for it to do something, anything. After several moments of the tensest staring contest of her life, she blinked. The face didn't budge. Y you need to leave. She finally spoke, surprising herself as she did. If you don't get out of here, I'm calling the cops. Again, the face did nothing. Do you hear me? Her voice climbed in pitch, her heart pounding against the inside of her chest. Who was he? What did he want? 
She became vaguely aware of the fact that she couldn't see the rest of the man's body, just his face, looking at her with a neutral expression, a look of vague curiosity, like someone watching a caged animal at the zoo might have. It was then she remembered something that made her blood run cold, made the towel drop from her hands as her stomach sank. She lived on the third floor. Her apartment had no balcony, no fire escape he could have climbed up. Whatever was looking at her through her window, it was no ordinary peeping Tom. She couldn't say how long she stared at the face, its unblinking eyes, its inscrutable expression. She moved closer to the window, step by step, until she was almost nose to nose with the thing. She couldn't think of it as a person, though it looked like one, mostly. She should run screaming out the door, looking for some kind of help, but what would she say? That there was a floating face looking at her through the window? What if it was somehow all in her head? Some sort of hallucination brought on by exhaustion and the stress of the move. She raised a fist and following a passive instinct, rapped on the glass. She didn't know what she expected, for it to blink, to move, to knock back, to say something, but nothing happened. It just stayed there, as if it were part of the window itself. Faith pulled the curtains closed, hiding the strange face from view. With any luck, it would be gone in the morning. She had worked hard to get this apartment, and she would be damned if she let some strange thing, whatever it was, drive her out of her new home. But as she climbed into bed and pulled the covers up to her chin, she could still feel its gaze on her, as if it could see through the thick fabric of the curtains. She rolled over onto her side, her back to the window, and tried her best to forget about it, to shake that horrible feeling of being observed. She lay there for hours, eyes open, heart racing. But finally the exhaustion won, and she slipped away into sleep. She didn't dream at all that night. It was as if she closed her eyes and seconds later, it was morning. She woke to the beep of her alarm, feeling as if she hadn't rested at all. The first thing she did was climb out of the bed and go to the window. Carefully, tentatively, she opened the curtains. She let out a sigh of deep relief. The face was gone. She must have imagined it after all. A bit concerning, but as long as it didn't happen again, she wouldn't have anything to worry about. Lack of sleep does strange things to the mind after all. No longer plagued by the fear of that strange face, Faith hopped into the shower and let the worries of the previous night wash away, disappearing down the drain. She brushed her teeth, dried her hair, did her makeup, and dressed for work. After a banana and a quick cup of coffee, she was out the door. Work was exceptionally busy that day, and it pushed any memory of the oddity in the window out of her mind entirely. She was even feeling good enough to accept her friend's offer to grab a drink after work. They met up at a bar down the street from her new place, sharing cocktails, memories, and a plate of onion rings. It was a perfect, lovely evening. By the time she got home, savoring the click of the key in the lock as she let herself into her quiet little sanctuary, she had completely forgotten about the unusual apparition. She swung the door open and rushed to dump herself onto the couch for a bit of TV before bed. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she saw it, the face back in its previous place, staring at her from the darkness outside. She gasped at the sight, her scream catching in her throat. It was just as she remembered it. Wait, no, something was different. What was it? She clapped her mouth in horror as she identified the change. Its expression was different. Gone was the vaguely interested neutral expression. Now, it was smiling at her. Not a pleasant smile, not a warm, friendly smile. A wicked smile, twisted and cruel. It knew she was afraid, that she'd been hoping it was gone forever, and it was enjoying itself. Her hands were shaking, nervous sweat beating on her brow. What do you want from me? She whispered, staring into its eyes. They didn't move, but they glittered with malicious glee just the same. What do you want from me? She repeated, her voice rising to a shout. Shut up! Her next door neighbor yelled, banging on the wall. It's after midnight! She couldn't bring herself to respond. She had more important things to attend to. Her stomach turned, bile rising in her throat. Would the face be gone again in the morning? Would it come back again at night? Was the apartment haunted, possessed by a specter doomed to reside in her window forever? Was that why the rent had been so affordable? Or maybe it was her. Maybe this thing had been drawn to her. Or maybe she was losing her mind unaccustomed to living alone, and her sanity was slipping away. She shivered at the thought, 
What was worse, if the face was on her head, or if it wasn't? Rather than attempt to answer the question gnawing at her, she closed the curtains. Out of sight, out of mind, she thought. She would have to keep the curtain closed, possibly forever. It was better than seeing that damned face grinning that horrible grin. But as she tried to settle in for another restless night, she could feel its eyes boring into her, burning into her skull. She had never felt so uneasy before. She prepared for cockroaches, for black mold, and for burglars, but not for this. This was something outside of her understanding, outside of reality itself. Just don't look, she whispered to herself. Just don't look at it. It became part of her daily routine. Wake up, ignore the window, go to work, try to forget about the window, get home, try desperately not to think about the window. She could always feel it, though. As soon as the sun went down, though, she kept the curtains closed. She knew it was there. She thought about checking to see what face it was making this time, but she couldn't bring herself to look. Gradually, her condition worsened. She woke up to a tightness in her chest, panic attacks that wrecked her body and felt like her heart might stop beating. Her stomach would ache. She struggled to keep food down. One morning, she rushed to the bathroom and spat up blood. The effect began to follow her out of the apartment too, far away from the face's dwelling. She would sit at her desk, struggling to focus on marketing campaigns and pitches, and she would feel a sudden pain in her stomach, forcing her to double over and groan with agony. She would see flickers of the pale face in her peripheral vision turning to look, only to find there was nothing there. When she walked down the hall to the elevator or down the street outside her building, she would feel as if someone was following her. She never saw anyone, never heard any footsteps coming up behind her, but she could never shake off the sensation. Soon, even her formerly dreamless nights of sleep, as fitful as they had been, became unsafe. She would toss and turn, sweating through her sheets, as her subconscious was tormented by chilling visions and terrible nightmares. She would dream of walking down a long, dark hallway that seemed to go on forever, and something coming up behind her, trying to grab her and drag her away. It would chase her, wide dark eyes and long, long limbs grasping at her as she ran and ran but never escaped. Other times she would dream of being locked in a damp basement, chained to a wall as the pale creature sat in a chair across from her, just watching, waiting for something, though she didn't know what. Every night, another nightmare that made her wake up screaming, fighting off invisible attackers. After two weeks of living in hell, she decided to look out the window again. She had to see, had to know. That night, when she opened the curtains, it was there. Mouth wide open, eyes glinting. It was laughing at her. Screw the deposit, enough was enough. She wanted her home back. She picked up the heavy lamp on her bedside table, wound it up, and threw it at the window with all her might. The glass shattered. Little crystalline shards sprang in every direction as the lamp flew through the air, out the window, and down to the street below. And just like that, the face was gone. She checked every other window in place, the little one in the bathroom, the peephole on her door, but it was nowhere to be found. She was free. Her knees gave out and she collapsed to the floor, her face in her hands and wept from sheer relief. Tomorrow she would clean up the broken glass and spin her landlord a story about a freak accident. Someone would come to fix the window, and it would be the best money she had ever spent. Eventually the whole ordeal would fade away from memory like a bad dream, but somewhere out there, Someone else was living the nightmare all over again, looking out a darkened window to see an unwelcome guest, the entity known as SCP-965. SCP-965 is a phenomenon affecting framed windows. When it appears, it manifests in the shape of a shadowy face, belonging to a pale man staring in through the window. The details of the man's face vary from person to person, as well as his apparent age and the direction he is facing. However, all reports point to the same figure at various ages, ranging from 10 to 55. The Foundation has attempted to use facial recognition software to identify a citizen matching the description of this figure, but so far, no one has been found. SCP-965 will not appear in just any window. It will only manifest when the lighting on the outside of the window drops below illumination of five candelas. The lighting on the inside of the window does not have any measurable effect. The face will only appear in the confines of a completely assembled window frame, though the window does not necessarily need to be installed anywhere. 
You will only move from one glass pane to another if its original point of manifestation is destroyed. The face can be seen from an outside vantage point, though it has been described by observers as looking away into the room. When SCP-965 first appears to someone, it produces feelings of unease, anxiety, and low-grade paranoia. Anyone within the visual range of the affected window will experience these feelings, even if the window is covered by curtains or any other means. Any individual that sleeps in an area visible to SCP-965's manifestation point will begin to experience difficulty sleeping, suffering from upsetting and disturbing dreams. However, this is not the endpoint of the entity's impact on those it appears to. At a point between 3 and 10 nights of sleep, after its initial appearance, the entity's facial expression will begin to shift into a noticeable smile. After this shift, the victim's symptoms will become physical as well as mental, including ulcers and intestinal bleeding, heartburn, abdominal pain, and even vomiting blood. This has been attributed to the entity's influence on the human body's reaction to heightened levels of stress and fear. The subjects that reach this stage of exposure to SCP-965 begin to see its face in windows in their dreams, as well as spotting it in their peripheral vision while going about their waking life. They begin to see the face out of the corner of their eye, even when the affected window is nowhere in sight. These additional sightings are accompanied by lingering feelings of paranoia and the sensation that something is following or watching them. Though the entity has never made a sound and does not move while it is visible, it can disappear and reappear in different poses. It has also displayed notable signs of sentience, appearing disappointed when it manifests in an empty room, and angry if it sees someone who broke its previous window. When presented with one of the agents who first brought it into custody, the entity appeared frightened for the first time. Testing involving SCP-965, involving the destruction of its host window, confirmed that a multi-paned window might act as multiple holding zones, but significant damage to its overall structure keeps it from being a viable replacement. In this particular case, the entity manifested in a nearby experimentation chamber's observation window, which was promptly destroyed in order to prevent any potential breaches. For a month following this incident, the entity manifested with noticeably hostile facial expressions, clearly resentful of its treatment. Only one other notable incident has occurred so far during the course of SCP-965's containment by the SCP Foundation. Dr. L, the rest of her name has been redacted from the official file, was the head researcher assigned to SCP-965 for several months before she filed an official request for transfer to a different test subject. She was beginning to experience intrusive visions of SCP-965 and lingering feelings of paranoia, lasting long after she left the Foundation's site. Her symptoms were consistent with those of someone who had slept in the presence of the entity, though she swore up and down she had never napped or slept at all in the vicinity of the affected window. She was temporarily relieved of her duties and provided with psychological care. So far, no other instances of SCP-965 impacting staff who have not slept in its presence have been reported, but this case set an unsettling precedent. The mental health of anyone assigned to SCP-965 is to be strictly monitored in case it expands its influence again. SCP-965 is contained within a framed, ready-to-install window made up of six panes of clear glass or other comparable material at a size of at least 15 centimeters by 30 centimeters. The window must be kept in an environmentally controlled storage facility, capable of withstanding earthquakes and other seismic activity. The window must be inspected at least once a week in order to check the integrity of the material. Additionally, at least two identical framed windows must be stored in the same facility, in separate chambers with additional insulation. Any lighting in the containment chamber should be kept at a minimum of 130 candelas at any time personnel are inside, with the exception of research and experimentation. Though SCP-965 is currently contained, the Foundation is unable to control its movement should its current window be destroyed. Therefore, SCP-965 is classified as Euclid. Scopophobia is the fear of being watched or looked at by others. Those suffering from this fear will often avoid windows, terrified of who might be standing on the other side, staring in and keeping track of everything they do. Even those of us without scopophobia might find ourselves feeling a prickle of dread while looking out the window at night, watching for a shadowy figure or a ghastly face pressed to the glass. Most of the time, of course, there is no one there. 
It's just an overactive imagination, the lingering effect of watching one too many scary movies. But eventually, your luck might just run out. One night, when the world falls quiet and you go to close the curtains before you go to sleep, just in case, you might just feel that someone is right there, on the other side of that thin pane of glass, staring at you with wide, unblinking eyes. It won't ever come inside, but it isn't going anywhere. And as long as you are where it can see you, you will never know peace again. Growing up in a small Virginia town near the mountains right on the border of West Virginia, Zane heard all kinds of stories from his grandmother. Tales of mountain lions who could transform into ghostly women, the Tailipo, a fluffy rodent-like creature on an endless quest to get its tail back from the hunter who took it, the Mothman that appeared with glowing red eyes to warn of impending tragedy. Most of all, she warned him about the deer. Sometimes, she used to say, when you're out in the woods late at night, you'll see a deer acting a little bit funny. Maybe it's making strange sounds. Maybe it's standing up like a man. Maybe it's staring at you from the shadows and won't look away. If you ever see one of these deer, promise me you'll get away from it as fast as possible. Don't look at it. Don't talk to it. Just get far, far away. He promised her every time. But as he got older, he started to forget his grandma's stories, letting them fade away with memories of the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. He didn't think about the stories again until he was older, a junior in college and embarking on a camping trip with his roommate Josh. They were both staying with Zane's family for the summer and had been enjoying the sunshine and fresh air. They'd gone hiking, picked blackberries, and gone fishing to their heart's content. After a while, they got sick of sleeping in the cramped house and decided to have a proper camping trip out in the mountains. Campsites were crowded this time of year, but Zane knew a spot just isolated enough that they could kick back, enjoy nature, and relax in peace. They packed their supplies and headed out into the forest for a weekend they would never forget. By nightfall, Zane and Josh had pitched their tents, built a fire, and were starting to make some dinner. They roasted hot dogs and heated cans of beans over the fire and decided to start telling some classic scary stories. Sitting by the crackling fire, listening to the rustling leaves, snapping twigs, and the chittering of animals all around, Zane couldn't help but remember the stories he had almost forgotten. All of the strange, inexplicable things that came out after the sun went down and the forest went quiet. He thought he could hear the footsteps of something walking by their campsite, circling them but it was probably just his imagination. As Josh told stories about babysitters stalked by killers and drivers picking up ghostly hitchhikers, Zane was thinking about the deer. He shuddered but shook it off, and after some more stories and a few too many s'mores, the two friends decided to get some sleep. After several hours, Zane woke to the sound of Josh unzipping his tent. He sat up, ready to yell at his friend for waking him up, but the sight of Josh's pale, frightened face stopped him. There's something here, was all Josh could say. His hands, Zane noticed, were shaking. Hey man, it's, it's okay, let's check it out. Zane patted Josh on the shoulder. He was pretty sure his friend just wasn't used to camping in actual nature, but reached for his hunting knife just in case. He grabbed a flashlight and switched it on, following Josh out into the darkness. He swept the beam across the clearing, and it illuminated a pair of orange eyes staring directly at him from behind a nearby tree. What the? He approached the shape, trying to get a clear look at it. As it became more illuminated, his stomach dropped. It was a deer, but something was wrong with it. Its mouth was wide open, its jaw working up and down like it was trying to make a sound, but nothing came out. But that wasn't the worst part. As the flashlight beam illuminated the animal's body, Zane realized that somehow, its head was on backwards. What the? Josh appeared behind him, gasping. Shh! Zane shushed him intensely. He suddenly remembered his grandmother's warnings. You know what? I don't feel so great. I think we should go back to the car and head to my place. He gave Josh a look, shaking his head as if to say, don't say another word. By the glow of their flashlights, the two packed up their campsite, all under the gaze of the misshapen deer. They drove home in silence, Josh only speaking once to ask, what was that thing? Zane shook his head. I don't know but it wasn't a deer. They crept back into the house and went to bed. They knew they would never speak of tonight ever again. As Zane began to drift off to sleep, his last conscious thought was to glance out the window 
There in the yard, not five feet away, was a deer watching. He didn't know it, but that night Zane encountered an instance of SCP-6448. SCP-6448 is an anomalous species of creatures that appear to belong to the Cervidae family, nicknamed the Not Deer. They are highly intelligent and can be distinguished from ordinary deer by unusual behavior and physical deformities. Some of these have included legs that bend backwards, the eyes of an animal other than deer, forward-facing eyes, jerky movements, lack of fear towards humans, and walking on two hind legs. Most notably and most frightening, SCP-6448 instances will watch and stalk humans for a duration of hours or even days. They will follow humans home and steal items from their domains including weapons, food, and other personal items. They are most frequently found in the deep woods at night, when a person is completely alone. If someone encounters an instance of SCP-6448, if they acknowledge any of the creature's anomalous traits, it will attack. In order to limit the loss of life and ensure that the SCP Foundation employees exercise the utmost caution when dealing with SCP-6448, the Cryptozoology Division issued the following guidelines. If you notice a deer that seems off, Look away and ignore it. If it knows that you've noticed it, it's too late. If you hear your name, whistling, or something else in the woods calling for you, don't acknowledge it. Never acknowledge it exists. Don't respond. Don't go looking for it. Don't call back to it. If you're walking at night and you feel something breathing on your neck or whispering behind you, the key to your safety is pretending that everything is normal. Your survival is dependent on your ignorance. Whatever SCP-6448 is, they appear to be intelligent enough to understand when they are being studied, and they don't seem to like it very much. On January 11, 1994, a group of three SCP-6448 instances broke into Site-41 in North Carolina, using a tunnel they had carved over a long period of time. At the time, there was an instance in containment, but in all of the chaos of the breach, the specimen was lost. Every time an instance was captured and contained near SCP-6448's habitat, it would later escape via similar tunnels. SCP-6448 was officially classified by the SCP Foundation in 1980, but those from the Appalachian region have known about these strange creatures since at least 1947. From folktales and campfire stories to second-hand and even first-hand encounters, the locals are aware of the Not Deer's existence and are largely familiar with the precautions necessary to avoid them. Though many of the civilians that encounter SCP-6448 avoid notifying the authorities, there have been several recorded 911 calls involving the Not Deer since 2000. The following is a log of those calls. February 1, 2000 Victim, age 41 female, dialed emergency services after hearing their name being called from the woods near their home. The victim recounts the vocalization being likened to a scream in a voice that they do not recognize, and requested assistance in locating the source. Emergency personnel requested the subject place their phone on the floor outside the home to listen for the alleged sounds. After two minutes, a vocalization was heard that was calling to the subject by name, emanating from the nearby forest. The subject was instructed to investigate the disturbance themselves and keep services updated on the situation. The victim then began to walk into the woodland, getting about 50 meters into the underbrush before inexplicably stopping. They claim there to be a noticeably large deer standing in the way of the path. She begins to walk closer, though states it does not move. Subject diverts from the path and begins walking in a different direction. After 30 minutes, no source of the voice is determined. The caller returns to their residence. June 13, 2002. Victim, age 28, male, calls 911 regarding a home break-in. The caller notes numerous items to be missing from their residence and requests an investigation. Operators dispatch two investigators to visit the home and, and pertain a potential perpetrator. The pair note that based on earlier CCTV images, all cutlery, sharp objects, firearms, light bulbs, and a single copy of the novel The Day After Roswell are missing. Also noted is that there is a complete lack of any fingerprints at the scene, with no doors or windows having been broken into. 
Analysis of the home's CCTV footage revealed there to be a two-hour period of missing film, with the exception of a single frame containing a service nippon on its hind legs reaching towards the camera. Its frontal hooves have been warped to resemble fingers. No footage of the entity exiting the home was discovered. November 19, 2005 a cattle farmer, age 54 male, reported to local authorities the sudden disappearance of over 30% of his largest herd. Response team searched the nearby area for four hours, though found no trace of his cattle. The victim was recommended to set up trail cameras and note any unusual activity overnight. At 1.11 a.m., two SCP-6448 are seen walking through the field before fleeing. One places an object into the ground, later discovered to be a single fork. A week after this discovery, 200 discarded bovine hooves appear at the location. March 4, 2009 Victim, age unknown, gender unknown, dials 911 to request assistance from animal services. The victim is standing within a forest in front of a service elephant, which is violently contorting. The victim attempts to state, you better get a vet or something, I don't think it's well, before a piercing screech is heard and the line falls silent. Recovered footage depicts the aforementioned animal squirming, seemingly in pain. A vicious churning is audible as a black mass erupts out of the instance, and the video turns to static. October 11, 2012 Victim, age 23 male, is a junior wildlife officer at the Cherokee National Forest, Tennessee. They radio their supervisor in the early morning regarding a herd of Odicolius virginius within the reserve. Supposedly, there is a single animal that, upon first glance, appears average, though possesses divergent attributes, including backwards joints, enlarged abdomen, and forward-facing eyes. Upon stating this, a distant whistle is audible, and the victim stumbles slightly. They begin to say, What the? Did it just whistle at me? Before the sound of hooves rapidly getting closer is heard. Notably, the hoofsteps did not sound to be in the traditional gallop of a cervid. October 12, 2012 The former victim's supervisor calls authorities following the victim's absence from the reserve night shift. Following this, their radio begins to crackle. The victim's voice can be heard on the other end, and he requests the supervisor's attention. He calls regarding a herd of Odicolius virginius within the reserve. They claim there is a single animal that upon first glance appears average though possesses divergent attributes including backwards joints, enlarged abdomen, and forward-facing eyes. Suspecting the creature to be a rare genetic malformation, the victim requests their supervisor to come to the location. The supervisor questions the victim about what happened the night previous. There is no reply. Upon the supervisor's and law enforcement's arrival at the site, a herd of approximately 80 Odicolius virginius was present. A single entity is in the field center and appears to be standing separate from the rest of the group. It flees the scene upon realizing the law enforcement's presence. Where it formerly stood lay a standard two-way radio. April 8, 2016 Victim, age 35 female, dials 911 using a satellite phone distressed. They state they are in Redacted. County Woods and are being followed. She claims that despite seeing no one for the duration of her hike, she, quote, feels as if she's being watched, and has heard someone walking behind her at various points in the trip. The victim is unable to give an adequate description of their location, but knows the route to return to her residence. Operators request the victim to return to a point wherein she can provide a sufficient geographic description of her position. The victim remains on the line for the duration of the hike back to a readily used portion of the wilderness trail. Along the journey, various unnatural sounds can be heard. These include footsteps, rock slides, coughing, whispering, and whistling. Nearing the main trail, all woodland noises such as birds and wind cease suddenly, and the victim states she can see a malformed deer carcass coated in a thick layer of black slime. At this time, human screams can be heard in the distance. Operators request the victim continue and ignore the other stimuli. Agents embedded in local law enforcement, suspecting SCP-6448 involved, notify Gamma-4 to the situation. Twenty minutes later, the victim returns to the main trail. Gamma-4, now operating the 911 call, informs the victim not to respond to any further unusual activity and briefly outlines service protocol. For the duration of the victim's journey to her home, two sets of breathing are audible. The victim successfully returns to her residence and shuts the door behind her. Now out of sight from SCP-6448, 
Agents inquire of the victim's address, and the victim promptly complies. Operatives instruct the victim to have possession of all firearms and weapons on the premises and to barricade herself inside a safe space with one exit point. The victim swiftly begins grabbing all available weapons and throwing them inside a wardrobe. It is at this time there is a knock on the front door. The victim does not respond and continues to hoard sharp objects from kitchen drawers. The knocking becomes more violent as the handle is jostled and is shaken incessantly. A voice on the other side repeats the phrase, Hello, it is me. Hello, let me in. In a calm manner as the door begins to shake. The victim retreats to her wardrobe, armed with a small firearm. Upon sealing herself in the space, the knocking ceases, and footsteps can be heard becoming further away. The sound of galloping is audible as the front door caves in. Hoofsteps can now be heard inside the home. The entity continues to repeat, Hello, it is me. Hello, let me in, as it searches the small building. A bright light flashes overhead, seemingly circling the house. Eventually, the entity enters the victim's bedroom. Through a small slit in the wardrobe door, the victim can see a Cervus canadensis standing on its hind legs and surveying the room. Its movements are crooked and stiff, seeming to struggle to stand in a bipedal fashion. It slouches down to a quadrupedal crouch, similar to the stance of an arachnid. It inhales heavily, and its head locks on the view of the wardrobe. It is noted as possessing human eyes, it scampers towards the subject and opens the door. A single gunshot is heard. Responders found no trace of either SCP-6448 or the victim. Containment of SCP-6448 is focused on the investigation of any deer exhibiting anomalous traits in and around the Appalachian area. Any civilian sightings of SCP-6448 are to be handled by Mobile Task Force Gamma-4 or the Green Stags. Any possible deaths resulting from SCP-6448 will be blamed on hiking accidents, and any reported sightings can be explained away with chronic wasting disease. CWD, occasionally referred to as zombie deer disease, is a prion disease affecting members of the Cervidae family. Symptoms of the illness include loss of motor function control and damage to decision-making, as well as gradual degradation of all mental faculties. It is 100% fatal. However, though the disease does exist, most recorded cases of it in the Appalachian region can actually be attributed to instances of SCP-6448. Any captured instances of SCP-6448 should be transported to Site-44 for the Cryptozoology Division's containment and study. On November 29, 2019, they finally got their chance to bring a not-deer into custody. The Green Stags were able to capture an instance of SCP-6448 with the help from MTF New 7 Hammerdown and their Heavy Vehicles Division, as well as some experimental shock rifles. One not deer was knocked unconscious in the conflict, and its body was loaded onto an armored helicopter and flown straight to Site-44 in Essex, England. At the site, it was then placed in a reinforced steel containment cell and heavily sedated. This entire process went off without a hitch. As the entity began to regain consciousness, cryptozoology specialist F. Oz watched it through a one-way glass window and attempted to speak to it through the intercom. Greetings, SCP-6448, researcher Oz began. At the sound of his voice, the creature jumped to its feet, staring at the intercom. Can you understand me? We've seen your genus speak English just fine in the past. The animal did not answer, but began licking one of its legs and behaving as if it were an ordinary deer. Researcher Oz sighed impatiently. Please, we know your secret. The not deer stopped what it was doing, freezing completely still as it listened to the words. Admittedly, it wasn't exactly well kept. If you just look at yourself for more than a few seconds, it is very clear that you're not normal. At this, the creature, which had been facing away from the window, swiveled its neck 180 degrees, breaking its own spine with an audible crack. It stared unblinking at the window and directly at Researcher Oz. Oz turned to the containment staff, suddenly anxious. I thought you said this was one way. The staff assured him that it was, and there was no way the not deer could see him. Still, its eyes were locked directly on his face. He shook off the sense of unease and continued his line of questioning. Are you something imitating deer? It is clear that if so, you possess basic anatomical knowledge of them though details are clearly faulty. In fact, a better question would be, how, if in fact you are not what you pretend to be? 
The knot deer opened its mouth at this, revealing unusually sharp teeth. It moved its jaw as if attempting to speak, but only a choking sound came out. <clears throat> Sh shall we move on? Oz asked. What I'm more concerned with here is why you take our people. Is it a vendetta? Spite? Food? For the first time in the interview, the knot deer blinked. It was an unnatural movement, forced and deliberate, like the creature was attempting to engage in an ordinary behavior rather than actually experiencing an involuntary impulse. Responding is mandatory, Researcher Oz prompted. The creature did not react. If you will not comply, Oz's tone grew stern, frustrated, maybe you'd like to see your brand new containment cell. At last, the entity spoke. Research. Research. Its voice resembled a distorted version of Oz's. Research? What kind of... Oz wasn't able to finish his question. July 7th, 1947, the creature said before ramming into the one-way glass and cracking it. As Oz stumbled backwards from the force, the creature collapsed on the ground, seizing and screaming as its abdomen. Get the stags in here now! Oz cried out, but it was too late. The black mass of something shiny and tendril leaped out of the knot deer, scuttling around the cell before shattering the window and leaving the empty shell of a deer behind. The Site-44 breach system activated and attempted to initiate emergency containment protocols, but the mysterious black mass escaped its sector, made its way toward the main exit, broke through the glass of the front exit door, and vanished into the shrubbery outside. The escaped anomaly could not be found and recontained. Ever since this incident, there have been a record-breaking number of chronic wasting disease cases identified in deer in the surrounding area, as well as an unprecedented increase in UFO reports. Further research is currently ongoing, but it is unknown whether we will ever truly know what these creatures are. Only one thing is for certain. They are definitely not deer. When you work for the SCP Foundation, you need to be ready for anything. That's why, as part of the Elite Foundation Training Regimen, senior researchers and guards are always running tests, even against things that aren't recorded anomalies under the auspices of the Foundation. That's why today, for a real change of pace here at SCP Explained, we're not talking about the SCP Foundation. We're talking about made-up monster stories crowdsourced over the internet. We're seeing how the Foundation might fare against iconic creepypasta monsters and maniacs like Herobrine, Jeff the Killer, The Slenderman, Eyeless Jack, Smile Dog, and many, many more. We've even created all new mobile task forces to take each one down. So could any of them best the Foundation's best and brightest? Let's take a look and find out. And be sure to tell us which is your favorite creepypasta entity down in the comments below. Let's get creepy. Jeff the Killer First up, we've got everyone's favorite disfigured, knife-wielding, homicidal teenager. Whether it's his terrifying visage or the iconic go-to-sleep catchphrase that's forever carved into your mind, there are probably a lot of people out there who have lost nights of sleep worrying that this pale-faced monster could be crawling through their window. But we know what you're probably wondering. Isn't Jeff just a serial killer? Why would the SCP Foundation use up its time chasing down any old regular human murderer? We'd ask for you to think again. Jeff has displayed feats that clearly mark him as anomalous. Despite suffering debilitating burns to his face and body, he still shows superhuman strength, agility, and durability. He's also able to see without eyelids, suggesting some supernatural element is at play. Victims have also reported him dodging shotgun blasts while stalking prey. So, how would the Foundation catch him? Seeing as Jeff's modus operandi is breaking into the homes of his victims while they sleep, the best method would be staking out a neighborhood where he's been shown to be active, keeping close observations on houses, and even setting up personnel for Mobile Task Force Sigma-9 My name is Jeff! in vacant houses as honey traps. Jeff is undeniably strong, fast, and tough, but if attacked and surrounded by operatives with superior tactics, he could be subdued without casualties. Then it would just be a matter of transferring him to a standard high-security humanoid containment cell. Speaking of horrifying creatures that come to you in the dead of night, the Rake. This supernatural entity has been around for almost a thousand years, 
as far as scattered reports are aware. It's also been reported across four continents and a huge number of locations within those continents. Though most recently, it's been reported in rural New York State and Idaho in the early 2000s. The rake is an inhuman beast most often known for its large, frightening eyes and its long, rake-like claws. Not only does the monster feed on human beings, but it also produces a traumatic level of fear in its victims. Thankfully, an entity like this is far more familiar territory for the SCP Foundation. Using their state-of-the-art web crawler software, they could catalog reported sightings as they happen and use clusters of these sightings to triangulate the location of the rake and dispatch field agents to perform reconnaissance missions. From there, it would just be a matter of waiting to strike and sending in Mobile Task Force Zeta-13 Rake Steppers, fitted with Dr. Dan's scramble goggles to prevent them from being affected by the seemingly cognitohazardous effects of viewing the rake. When the creature is placed in containment and kept in a state of perpetual bright light, it would simply be a matter of applying a Scranton Reality Anchor to prevent the creature from somehow phasing out of containment. Just make sure you avoid its big, staring eyes in the meantime. Though, that won't be a problem with the next creepypasta monster, Eyeless Jack. This stealthy creature has its no eyes on one thing and one thing only, your kidneys. And unless you want to die or spend the rest of your life on a dialysis machine, we recommend you keep your distance from him. He's discreet, devious, and diabolical. And if you wake up in the middle of the night to see him staring down at you, it may be the last time your body is able to filter toxins out of its blood naturally. Thankfully, we have a way to make the Foundation put a stop to his organ harvesting ways. Sometimes, to catch a jack, you need to use a jack. There's no way to catch Eyeless Jack without delicious live kidney bait, so we'd recommend sending in someone who has kidneys to spare, Dr. Jack Bright. Bright could be the perfect bait without losing his life, luring Eyeless Jack into a decoy house while Mobile Task Force Gamma 391 hit the road Jack, prepares to spring their cunning trap and plunge this unpleasant kidney muncher into a humanoid containment cell forever. But our next creepypasta entity doesn't want your kidneys, it wants your life. Smile Dog. Our next entity seems like a harmless little JPEG to the untrained eye. A little freaky, sure, but nothing to lose your mind over. But we know that there's far more to this grinning husky than meets the eye. If some reports are to be believed, this image may even be connected to the devil himself. If you're unlucky enough to see this image in the world, it may already be too late for you. Those who see it, typically as an email attachment from a mysterious address, spend the last week of their life in a hell of the mind before eventually succumbing to a bleak and mysterious death. It's a classic cognitohazardous image, and the most frightening part is that it's self-propagating, with one of the only ways to even mildly alleviate the effects seeming to be spreading the word by subjecting another person to this nightmare. That's when we bring in Mobile Task Force Row 19, Naughty Dog, an elite group of hardened military programmers handpicked from the CIA's Cyber Warfare Unit. They use their very particular set of skills to design web crawler software that roots out and takes down Smile Dog images across the web, and hopefully, one day find the origin of this whole thing. The next creature, on the other hand, We've given up on finding the origin of that. The Expressionless. This entity kind of looks like a terrifying store window mannequin, except rather than modeling fast fashion, she prefers to swallow cats whole and murder hospital staff. Oh, and she also calls herself God. Isn't she just so quirky? Her primary abilities seem to be extreme strength and large, sharp teeth that will easily rend through human flesh. Thankfully, not anything the SCP Foundation hasn't dealt with countless times before. Seeing as the only recorded incident involving the Expressionless took place at a hospital in Los Angeles, that would be the most sensible area to stake out. A detail from the creature's original encounter is also telling. It reacted severely to the doctor's attempts to sedate it, implying that chemical sedation is an effective method of incapacitating the beast. That's why every member of Mobile Task Force Kappa-99 Ain't No Dummy is a sharpshooter with a tranquilizer rifle capable of putting a hippo to sleep 
with a single shot. She'll probably feel less like a god in her containment cell, but while this monster is expressionless, the next one has one very notable expression. Mr. Widemouth Compared to some of our other creepypasta contenders, Mr. Widemouth may not look like much, but that, our dear friends, is exactly what this nasty little malfactor wants you to think. He may look like Gizmo's slightly demented cousin, but his intentions are even more sinister than that of your average gremlin. If you're a kid home on a sick day, Mr. Widemouth might strike up a conversation. After gaining your trust, he'll try to lure you to his special place beyond the trees for some fun. But take it from us, all you'll find out there is your doom. This crafty little creep's small stature and manipulative stealth abilities might pose somewhat of a challenge for the SCP Foundation, but that doesn't mean they can't get him with a little intelligence and elbow grease. Mobile Task Force Alpha 18, the Smile Smashers, will follow reports of children disappearing from their isolated homes under mysterious circumstances. Then, using an extra-strength butterfly net straight from the folks at Foundation R and D, they can chase down and capture the nasty little monster. But that won't be the case for this next demonic offering. No, this creepypasta legend is the one that captures you. No End House In recent years, there's been a spike in interest in so-called extreme haunted houses. If you're not sure what these places are like, basically picture a CIA black site with the occasional plastic skeleton. It's all waterboarding, stress positions, and car batteries. But even those places are nothing compared to the nightmare of No End House. It's a moving, possibly even sentient spatial anomaly hiding in a haunted house attraction. And if you find yourself inside, best believe you're never going to see the outside ever again. Thankfully, Mobile Task Force Delta 35, McKamey's Bane, are on the case. Around Halloween every year, they use web crawlers to detect chatter around no end house events, so they can swoop in and intercept, preventing hapless thrill seekers from being devoured by the house and providing amnestic treatment for anyone who has too close of a call. Sadly, the Foundation will not be able to provide refunds for those who already paid. Speaking of paying, you'll really pay if you end up in our next creepypasta location of doom. Abandoned by Disney Mowgli's Kingdom, an abandoned tropical Disney attraction based on the Jungle Book movie, is abandoned for a reason. It's a hotbed for anomalous activity, including freakishly large mutant snakes, reports of ghostly activity, and most prominent of all, a terrifying, photo-negative Mickey Mouse that stalks any hapless urban explorers who happen to find their way onto the site. Of course, the Walt Disney Corporation keeps it all hush-hush, and the SCP Foundation is happy to give them a hand on that front. Even if the frightening photo-negative Mickey was removed from the site, it's likely the other may appear and continue haunting the site. And seeing that the site cannot be moved as a whole, the Foundation's best bet is to form a perimeter around the abandoned Disney attraction, preventing anything normal from getting in and anything abnormal from getting out. Mobile Task Force Omega-17, Sons of Shere Khan, are ever vigilant and maintain a strong presence in the surrounding area. But you don't need to go anywhere for this next anomalous terror. If you're a big Nintendo fan, it might be sitting in your house right now. Ben Drowned This haunted NES cartridge of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask contains the restless spirit of its last owner, a guy named Ben who, well, drowned. If you slot this creepy little gaming experience into your Nintendo Entertainment System, you'll soon find that the soul of Ben is communicating with you directly, telling you about how he died and why his consciousness lingers on embedded in the code of the game. Thankfully, other than the psychological trauma of experiencing the game, you're unlikely to be actually harmed by playing it. However, Mobile Task Force Beta 51, Gamers Don't Have Rights, are still on the case. They'll try to intercept all cursed copies of the game and administer amnestics to anyone who is unfortunate enough to play it. While it is still undeniably spooky, it does feel like a relief to finally find a safe class anomaly on this list. The same can, sadly, not be said about our next creature, the Goat Man. If you're a fan of camping, then this malicious mimic is going to be your worst nightmare. 
This monster has existed as a fixture of terror in everything from a number of Native American mythologies to iconic 4chan green text posts. You may be thinking, oh, what's so scary about a goat? But this thing is no goat. Aside from the fact that it's the greatest of all time at getting you to crap your cargo shorts in the woods. First, you'll smell blood in the air, and then feel an odd electrical static, like the feeling all around you right before a lightning strike. Then you'll hear noises, strange noises. Something not quite like a voice, like an animal throat straining to form human words. That's when you might notice your group of friends has one more person than you remembered. And the one thing worse than noticing that is not noticing it. Because if you don't, you may end up as the shape-shifting goat man's latest victim. Mobile Task Force Theta 11 Got Your Goat are constantly on the hunt for this one but its extreme intelligence and ethereal nature make it a nightmare to track. But forget nightmares to track. It's time for Laughing Jack. This candy-striped clown from hell is a really nasty customer. Definitely do not engage unless you've got a Scranton Reality anchor on hand and you've got a backup from members of Mobile Task Force IOTA 40. Put Jack in the box. As a former imaginary friend gone rogue, Laughing Jack is a semi-intangible reality warper of considerable power. He targets his victims with sadistic glee, pulling them into his dark carnival to experience all kinds of nasty tortures. Laughing Jack shows no remorse, giggling while committing every evil act you can imagine. You'll probably only find this clown funny if you're already a depraved serial killer, and his sense of humor is likely to utterly break your mind unless you've been given amnestic treatment from the SCP Foundation. This is an anomaly that would probably get along swimmingly with SCP-106, the old man. They could chat over a few drinks one evening and share notes on how to cause the maximum pain to their hapless victims. That being said, few people understand maximum pain more than the next horrifying abomination on our roster, the Russian Sleep Experiment Test Subjects. As anyone familiar with the work of GRU Division P will tell you, the Soviets performed some pretty horrific occult activities throughout the 20th century. One of the most disturbing of these was the infamous Russian Sleep Experiment, wherein a group of unfortunate political prisoners were doused on a classified anomalous gas that robbed them of their ability to sleep. A chemical compound that the scientists hoped might increase the productivity of their workers and soldiers by eliminating sleep. Instead, over several terrifying days, the chemical and the sleep deprivation that ensued caused the subjects to instead become demonic monsters. While current accounts of the story suggest that all the subjects were killed, we can't say for sure there weren't more out there, or that the experiment hasn't been repeated. As such, Mobile Task Force Omicron 8, Nighty Night, is constantly on the lookout for freakish skeletal men wandering through the woods, never sleeping outside the dark forests where Siberian gulags used to be based. Better safe than sorry, right? Though of course, you won't feel safe at all if you've spent your childhood watching scary media. Like horror movies or eerie SCP YouTube channels, like and subscribe by the way, or scariest of all, a strange little puppet show called Candle Cove. Feel a little chill go down your spine, Oh yes, you remember this show, don't you? You love seeing all those cute little puppets going on swashbuckling pirate journeys on their adorable boat, the Laughing Stock. Though there was always that villain, wasn't there? You think his name was Jawbone, but that's not what you called him. You called him the Skin Taker, because he always had that long cloak made of tanned human skin. You also remember that one episode that was just all the characters screaming. I mean... How could you possibly forget? And most of all, you remember asking your mom about it, and her telling you that you never actually watched a show called Candle Cove. You just sat around watching Static for hours on end. Of course, the SCP Foundation keeps close tabs on everything related to this traumatic childhood memory. Broadcasts of the show are seemingly impossible to contain. All the Foundation can really do is track down people who have seen it and provide amnestic treatment. Though trust us, there are things that will make your childhood far worse than just watching Candle Cove. Like running into this next iconic monster, the Slenderman. 
This terrifying entity is powerful as he is iconic. A shape-shifting, faceless, tentacled nightmare in a three-piece suit who likes to hide in forests and abandoned buildings, either stealing children away or influencing their minds until they become his proxies. Supernatural servants who do anything their inhuman master asks them to. The Slenderman is one of the most powerful monsters in all of Creepypasta, so the Foundation certainly has their hands full with keeping his tentacles under wraps. All that Mobile Task Force Chai-90 Marble Hornets can do is track sightings and keep children out of the woods when the danger of potential Slenderman encounters arises. Getting him actually contained basically seems out of the question. Whew. After all this, we might need to relax. Maybe grabbing a nice sugar-free soda and playing a session of Minecraft might make us feel better. We'll be safe there, right? Well, probably. Unless we encounter Herobrine. The SCP Foundation, funnily enough, is actually no stranger to anomalies trapped in Minecraft. They've got SCP-4335, a welt in the crucible, to thank for that. But this Minecraft horror story is a little more personal. Herobrine is a mysterious user with the Minecraft default skin, except with one difference. Completely white eyes. This mysterious figure invades different Minecraft servers, acting incredibly strange towards the people who created them. What makes this more than just some random troll? Well, according to legends, Herobrine is the manifestation of the dead brother of Minecraft's creator, Notch. Naturally, the Foundation doesn't want people running into ghosts on Minecraft, so they dispatch Mobile Task Force Chai-69, blocked and reported, to quarantine any servers where Herobrine is sighted, and spread misinformation that the crafty little entity had never actually existed in the first place. What is the truth of the situation? It's unclear. And that's exactly how the Foundation likes it. So there we have it, folks. How the SCP Foundation would counteract some of the most infamous creepypasta creeps and creatures out there. Which was your favorite? Do we miss any? And would you like to see any of these expanded into a full video in the future? Let us know down in the comments, if you dare. <laughs>
information, and security for the entirety of the human race. I'm sure you are well aware of the number of world-destroying catastrophes that have been averted by the hard-working researchers, agents, and other members of the Foundation, all without the general public having the slightest clue that something was amiss. With state-of-the-art holding cells all over the globe, and the sharpest minds humanity has ever produced working around the clock to ensure the protection of humanity, it is hard to imagine an entity that should not be contained by such a group. And yet, one such entity does exist. SCP-001 You may have come across the O5 Council by this point. While the SCP Foundation operates beyond the world's jurisdiction, the O5 Council operates beyond the Foundation's jurisdiction. The rules, methods, and protocols that are the cornerstone of securing, containing, and protecting countless entities around the world sometimes cannot be applied. Certain entities require us to temporarily abandon our humanity, abandon our sense of order, and step briefly into chaos for the greater good. I'm telling you all of this because SCP-001 is not held in a containment cell. There are no keypads, locked doors, observation windows, or health and safety forms. SCP-001 is not confined to a specific territory or even a specific country. For some SCPs, this is a practical necessity. Serpents that are hundreds of kilometers long swimming through the depths of the ocean, for example. But for SCP-001, it serves a more psychological purpose. The Scottish Highlands are the most remote part of the United Kingdom. Out there, you can walk for miles and miles without seeing a single soul. Open countryside, mountains, lochs, and forests surround you in all directions. The weather is harsh and unrelenting, the walking even more so. On a regular basis, walkers fall and break their legs, but without phone service or anyone else nearby to come and help, they can quickly disappear into the wilderness forever. The peat bogs of Scotland used to see human sacrifices in early settlements. Afraid of the ghosts and spirits that haunted the bogs, people would throw their family members into the deepest parts and watch them drown, hoping that whatever was lurking beneath wouldn't come and find them. So as the group of soldiers crested the top of the mountain and looked down beneath them to the eerie peat bogs obscured by mist and constant rainfall, you would forgive a shiver running up their spines. But of course, it didn't. That was because this group of soldiers were quite unlike any others that humanity has ever produced. All were nameless. None of them existed on any government databases, on any Foundation databases, or even on the databases of the O5 Council itself. Their individual backgrounds, nationalities, and families were totally unknown to everyone other than themselves. Some had been tortured for years, others had been the torturers. The thing that united them, however, was their inhuman ruthlessness. A squad of eight soldiers utterly devoid of any sense of empathy. What could they possibly have to be afraid of in the peat bogs when they themselves were the evil ghosts walking through? But then, one person was afraid. A shiver ran up her spine as she looked over the edge and down into the murky black and green below. SCP-001-1 Around her neck was the bomb collar. Each of the eight soldiers surrounding her had a button mounted on a watch on the back of their wrists. At any moment, any one of them could hit the button, and all four and a half kilograms of plastic explosives would go off, sending her on an express trip to oblivion. Aside from the collar, she wore a plain white dress made of cotton. It was muddy and torn apart at the hem from days of walking through the Scottish wilderness. When she had first arrived, she had begged those around her to supply her with some warm clothes, something practical that would keep her comfortable and stave off any illness. Her requests, however, had not been acknowledged. Clutching in her trembling, outstretched hands was the machine, SCP-001-A. From its external experience, you would think it was nothing more than a wooden box, a perfect cuboid made from glossy dark wood. There were no symbols, no seams, no latches, nothing to indicate any method of operation. When the woman and the machine had first been delivered into the hands of the O5 Council, the researchers had spent weeks and millions of dollars trying to activate the machine. 
Their best scientists had scanned for every possible form of radiation and tried every method they could conceive to stimulate the box into opening. The ultimate failed attempt involved traveling to North Korea, where they negotiated placing the box 20 centimeters beneath a small nuclear warhead in return for granting the dictatorship key information on how to construct such a weapon. As we have established, the O5 Council operates beyond any kind of jurisdiction. Yet, at the bottom of the irradiated crater sat a perfectly intact wooden box that was cool to the touch and showed no signs of radioactivity. Only one person could interact with the box and unearth the secrets that were inside, SCP-001-1, the woman who stood trembling on the side of the mountain. A gun jabbed her in the back, forcing her to continue moving. She had asked the soldiers around her how much longer they had to walk that day, but none of them had replied. They never did. In the six years that she had been held hostage by this tiny militia, she had never once heard any of them say a word, not even to each other. Perhaps it was this telepathic understanding that seemed to run between them that unnerved her the most. Despite having never spoken to each other, each soldier seemed to understand the others intimately, and she had no doubt that any one of the eight would press the button on their wrist at a moment's notice. Sadly for her, she knew this from experience. The incident happened four years ago now, as the group was traveling through Patagonia. It was a day almost identical to the one she was having now. They had been transported by a helicopter flown by one of the eight into the middle of the wilderness. There, they had marched for days without saying a single word. Exhaustion had overtaken her legs, and she stumbled to the ground. Unfortunately for her, this happened slightly too close to the female soldier in front of her. Her knees hadn't even hit the ground before the blast went off. The woman didn't remember it, of course. How could she? In an instant, her mind had been utterly destroyed. What she did remember was the next 18 months as her body slowly healed itself one brain cell at a time. It wasn't so much like waking up from a nightmare, it was more constructing a nightmare slowly, alongside your consciousness as neuron by neuron your brain reformed itself, each individual cell screaming in terror at what had happened to it. They had her marching again before she was fit to move. Her motor controls had been all over the place, she had fallen over regularly, and the terror of having one of the soldiers push the button again engulfed her with every movement. And yet, perhaps the most incredible thing about SCP-001-1 was the fact that if you had asked her if she should have been held in this kind of containment, she would immediately have agreed without batting an eye. The only person capable of opening the box, she recognized how dangerous her existence was. Only she had seen into the mysteries of the box, only she had seen the horrors laid inside of it, and so only she could fully understand the gravity of their situation. They kept her on the move in order to keep the world safe. Had she been held in a containment cell, she would have posed too great of a risk. Out here in the wilderness, the entire planet was her containment cell, hidden in the middle of humanity's biggest haystack. No one, not even the O5 Council's central command, knew her location. The only people who were aware of it at any given time were herself and the eight soldiers surrounding her with guns drawn. So you can imagine her horror when, out of the sheets of rain, appeared the figure of a person carrying a rifle. The gunfire broke out before SCP-001-1 even had a chance to hit the ground. Bullets whizzed through her hair and cracked open the rocks all around her. The eight soldiers surrounding her dive for cover as the figure in the rain slumped to the ground lifeless. One of the soldiers grabbed the woman by her explosive collar and threw her behind a rock. Clasping her hands over her ears, she closed her eyes and waited for the fight to be over. No one was shooting, until a second figure emerged from the rain waving their arms wildly. Gunfire again. She wasn't quite sure what had happened, but all of a sudden, the woman was falling down the cliff. She had just been trying to shift her position to get deeper into cover, but she clearly hadn't noticed just how close to the edge she was. Down and down and down she fell until, with a crack in her ankle, she landed in the peat bog. Gunfire cracked on the mountain above her, but the only thought that filled the woman's mind was the terror that at any moment, the explosive collar around her neck would be detonated as one of the soldiers above her realized that she was missing. Seconds passed as the fear mounted in her chest. 
With each passing moment, the anxiety grew more and more crippling. She had to know. She had to prepare herself if it was about to happen. She had to use the machine and look into the future. Dragging herself forward through the muck, the woman snatched at the wooden box. It came alive at her touch. Different pieces shifted and opened beneath her fingers like some kind of elaborate puzzle. No one had taught her how to use this thing. It just happened. Her fingers would just dance across its surfaces, pushing and pulling, opening and closing, twisting and turning, and locking into place until all of a sudden, there it was. The box was wide open in front of her. Taking a deep breath and allowing the rain to fall on her head for another brief moment, the woman leaned forward and stepped into the box. On the trail above her, the gunfire stopped. Without a word of communication, the soldiers had deftly flanked the group of people who had approached them. In less than a minute, they neutralized each individual that came their way. In unison, the group of them walked up to the bodies, turning them over to examine their faces. They were nobodies, just a group of hikers lost in the rain. What had looked like a gun turned out to be nothing more than a walking pole. Five of them in total, none of them older than 24. Without words, the soldiers picked up the bodies and threw them over their shoulders as they scrambled their way down to the cliffs to the woman in the machine beneath them. Once they reached the bottom of the slope, they discarded the five bodies carelessly into the bog. Within a couple of hours, those five hikers would have sunk to the bottom and begun the long process of being embalmed into the depths. Perhaps someone would find them in a few thousand years' time as part of an archaeological dig, perhaps, but it was not their concern. The eight soldiers surrounded the women, guns drawn, and stared at her coldly. I used the machine, she told them. I used it without your permission. I, I don't know what the rules are. I don't know if we even have any rules here, but I, I thought you should know. The soldiers continued to look at her in silence. The box was closed now, sitting back on her lap as it always was. I, I try to see my future. Anytime I've used the box before, I've looked at the lives of others. I've seen economic crashes, climate disasters, genocides, wars, love, and life, and death. I've done so at the hands of the O5 Council, as they've told me, given them the information and prevented the destruction of the world. Never once have I looked at my own future. The soldiers lifted her to her feet and tried to march her onwards, not listening to a word she was saying. Her broken ankle buckled and screamed beneath her. She had to hop to keep up with them. What other choice did she have? They would push the button if she didn't. She didn't know why she kept talking, but she did. For the first time, the machine lied to me. I saw that I was assassinated in 1987 in Cuba. It was years before I even built the box. Before any of this happened to me, I, I saw in my future that I no longer existed. That the machine no longer existed, but that future was years ago, and none of it happened. The machine doesn't lie, so why is it lying to me now? Why can't I see my own future? If any of the soldiers were paying attention, they didn't show it. They just continued to march her into the rain, as the bomb weighed heavily around her neck. Roll up, roll up, step right this way, ladies and gentlemen. On the other side of these canvas doors, you're about to witness something so monstrous, so hideous, so repulsive, that it will turn your stomachs and fill you with amazement. The creature you'll find in this tent has been known to elicit all manner of responses from well-to-do folks like yourselves. You may want to laugh at it, you may want to strike it down, you may even want to throw rotten fruit at it. And believe you me, we are prepared for that. You will find all manner of rotten tomatoes, eggs, and other festering foods that are begging to be pelted for the low, low price of five cents per handful. If you follow me through these doors and gather around this cage quietly, perhaps you will see it. Wait for your eyes to adjust to the dark and hold your revulsion until you cannot bear it anymore. Only then will we get to look at the papery gray skin sagging loose over a swollen gut. Marvel at its tree trunk legs barely strong enough to support its own weight, its deformed trunk that hangs limp off the front of its face, and its ridiculous ears that flap nervously when it's afraid. Don't be afraid of the tusks sticking out from its face or its cries of pain and anguish. Instead, hold your tongues and wait, for if you're patient enough and perhaps with a slight beating, it may even play us a song with the valves on its trunk. Then, and only then, you're permitted to pelt the Elephant Man with whatever you see fit as you bask in the glory of Herman Fuller's Circus of the Disquieting. Reese Freeman didn't have much of a choice but to join the circus at the age of 14. The cast-out son of a freed slave in New Orleans, he spent much of his early life wandering the streets. 
trying not to get into any trouble. In the late 1800s, very few places were interested in hiring a young black man, unless of course they were looking to turn him back to the life that his father had fought so hard to escape. That's why when Reese was out fishing one afternoon and saw a big red tent going up on the outskirts of town, he couldn't help but wander over. Much to his surprise, a group of black men were the ones raising the marquee. They didn't look like slaves either. Reese had never heard of a circus. The closest he'd ever come to seeing was a traveling entertainment cart that would sometimes pop up around town with a dancing bear in a cage or a glass ball in a pack of tarot cards. The brightly colored tents that went up one after another were enough to draw a crowd. Even the most well-respected in New Orleans came out for a look. Standing ankle-deep in the river, Reese peered over at the man who came out to address the throng. Dressed in a long tailcoat with a tall top hat, the man stood on a box of fruit and waved a cane dramatically in the air. Good folks of New Orleans! What you're about to witness tonight has never before been seen this side of the Mississippi! Wonders and amazement galore! Spectacle and intrigue! Mystery and mayhem! And just a touch of the impossible! I go by the name of Herman Fuller, the most talented and notorious circus master in the entire United States. The dazzling array of shows that I've brought before you is not for the faint of heart or the weak of constitution. Your stomachs will be turned and your minds may be altered, but it promises to be a night that you will never forget. Reese wasn't much interested in any of what he had just said. This kind of two-penny show was reserved for the folks who had the money to throw around on needless things like smiling and having a nice evening. What Reese was far more interested in were the groups of men working behind the scenes, pulling various carts and setting up all of the stalls. A lot of them didn't look much older than him. A grin spread across his face. SCP-4409 insisted on being interviewed in the dark. With all the lights in the interview chamber switched off, Dr. Simon Crossley entered the room and sat down across from the elephant man. Even in the dim light, though, he was able to still make out part of the man's features. The ivory tusks, the hanging nose, and the nervously twitching ears. The man had been picked up in St. Louis, where local police had found him panhandling in the streets. While he certainly seemed harmless enough, it was important for the Foundation to take him in just to be sure. Sitting in the dark interview room, Reese Freeman was apprehensive at first about telling his side of the story. A life of being mocked, spat on, and chased out of towns had left him with a real distrust of other people. That was probably made worse by his apprehension at being put in another cage within the Foundation. He told Dr. Crossley that he was born as normal as could be, that his current ghastly affliction was something done to him quite some time ago, but as much as it pained him to recollect, it was a tale that he knew he'd probably have to tell. Dr. Crossley replied that he was all ears. It took Dr. Crossley a few seconds to realize his faux pas. SCP-4409 glared at him before continuing to explain how he was made the way he was. Reese Freeman had managed to land a job with the circus surprisingly easily, despite having no previous experience and no references to back him up. Herman Fuller took a shine to him. It was menial work, and not many folks were up to doing it, but since Reese had never had a job before, he didn't know any better. He started out at the bottom of the ladder, scraping out feces, washing down old cages, and carrying heavy crates. The once scrawny 14-year-old boy quickly turned into a stocky 17-year-old with broad shoulders and strong legs. They would travel from town to town across most of the United States, stopping off in major cities for weeks at a time to bring in as much money as possible before moving on. Reese didn't save much of that money, but he didn't mind. The fact that he got two meals a day and something to do with himself was enough. In fact, he kind of enjoyed sleeping on top of the carts as the horses pulled them across the dusty American roads. The one thing that always seemed to affect him, though, was that he was never allowed to actually see inside the tents. He would see folks come and go through the canvas doors week after week, but was never allowed so much as a peek inside himself. The older guys were responsible for throwing the canvas sheets over the cages, which would remain that way as they traveled. Not having seen much of the world at that point, Reese didn't have much of an idea of what could be in those cages. Perhaps some kind of animal from a foreign country, something from Africa or Asia. They made all kinds of noise. Reese said that most of them sounded like humans, 
but then they'd go and make strange animal sounds that no human mouth could ever produce. One night, his curiosity got the better of him. Hanging back before the crowds got into the tent, he sidestepped over to the entrance, making sure that no one saw him, and took a peek through the doorway. It was dark inside, too dark to make out much of what was happening. The crowd of people was standing between him and the cage, all jostling and leaning this way and that, trying to make out whatever it was that was inside. A screeching sound filled the air, making the whole crowd and Reese outside jump right. Standing on his tiptoes, he tried his best to see what was moving around in that cage. It seemed to be moving around like a person, lurching this way and that, but the sounds coming from it sounded more like a bird. And sure enough, after a moment, a huge pair of disproportionately ugly wings stretched out from either side of the creature, flapping and sending a rush of air through the tent so powerful that it blew the flap wide open in front of him, just as Herman Fuller turned around to see him standing there. Reese bolted and hid behind one of the carts. He was going to be in trouble for this, he was sure of it. It was one of Fuller's only rules of the circus, and he had just gone and broken it. He was in the hottest water imaginable. But as nighttime fell and the drags of the spectators wandered out of the tent, Fuller seemed to be in too bad a mood at all. Watching him from a distance, Reese got the impression that he might not actually be in as much trouble as he thought. Fuller caught his eye and came over, cane twirling and top hat sitting jauntily atop his head. Reese got off on the wrong foot, apologizing right away for spying into the tent. The circus master just laughed it off and slapped him on the back. Reese, my boy, don't worry about it. I've got much bigger plans for you. Much, much bigger. That night, as Reese lay in bed, he had a terrible dream about what he had seen in the tent that day. Circus of the Disquieting was certainly an apt title for this place. The image of that strange, shadowy bird person in the cage haunted his nightmares until suddenly, two pairs of strong hands gripped him and ripped him out of his sleep. He knew better than to fight back. This was surely going to be his comeuppance for breaking Fuller's rules earlier. They dragged him into the main tent where there was an oil lamp in the middle, illuminating what looked like a heavy wooden operating table. His wrists and ankles were strapped in, and then the two men left him alone. He had half a mind to scream, but with all the caged-up creatures from the circus around him, he doubted anyone would pay him much mind. It was almost an hour before Herman Fuller walked into the tent. By this point, Reese expected him to be walking in with surgical equipment, gloves, maybe even a saw but the man had nothing in his bare hands. Herman Fuller asked him if he ever heard of Joseph Merrick. Reese didn't answer. Of course he had heard of the Elephant Man. The whole world had been talking about Joseph Merrick for months. A man born so hideously deformed that people had compared him to an elephant, though the resemblance wasn't that convincing. This sentiment was clearly shared by Fuller, who placed one hand on either side of Reese's face and began to softly massage his cheeks explaining how disappointed he was that Merrick didn't actually look all that much like an elephant. Reese's cheeks started to hurt as the man massaged him, almost as if he was stretching and pulling at his face, finding loose skin. The boy asked Fuller what he was doing. The circus master just smiled at him and explained that it was an old technique handed down in his family. A gift, he called it. He started touching Reese's nose, gently pulling at it with more and more pressure. Much to Reese's surprise, he felt his nose elongating, growing longer and longer in the man's hand. He tried to twitch his face and was starting to find that his new nose twitched along with it. The longer it grew, the more painful it felt, the skin and flesh from his head being ripped and pulled into a new shape. At several points, Reese felt ready to pass out from the agony, but the circus master kept talking to him kept him awake through the whole ordeal as he molded the boy's face like clay into the shape of an elephant. Lying on the bench panting, Reese could see his trunk from between his two eyes. It was a nightmare. That was all it was. But then Fuller reached under the workbench and lifted out a small hand drill. One by one, he punched holes into the top of Reese's trunk, installing little valves like a trumpet as he went. Standing back to admire his handiwork, he told Reese that he would be his new favorite attraction. My boy, I have made you into a star. The tusks did not come straight away. Over the course of several months, they slowly and painfully emerged from his deformed jaw. 
His elephantine legs were also not part of his initial transformation, but instead came as a result of health issues he developed while being trapped in a cage for several decades. Crowds of people would come and go, flocking to see the Elephant Man. Having spent the first part of his life constantly hungry, Reese was now being overfed every day. Hands would come to his cage and force him to eat rich, fatty foods, denying him any possibility of exercise. The broad shoulders and strong legs that he had developed while working at the circus melted away under layers and layers of fat. His skin went gray and papery, folding and wrinkling in on itself, either from Fuller's magic or just from a lack of sunlight. Whatever it was, with every passing day, Reese Freeman steadily became more and more hideous. SCP-4409 was stuck in the circus for much of his life. Eventually, Herman Fuller moved on and is currently being hunted by the SCP Foundation. When he did, SCP-4409 was able to bargain for its freedom from the circus. Wandering from city to city, never sticking around for very long, SCP-4409 begged for change at the side of the road. Some people would feel sympathy, while most would feel horror at its disfigurement. From its years trapped in a cage, SCP-4409 has developed severe health issues, including gout, severe obesity, and metabolic syndrome. While in Foundation custody, it is fed a special diet to counteract these conditions. As of yet, the Foundation has no way of reversing what was done to Reese Freeman in the tent in the 1800s. As Reese poses no threat to the Foundation, he is allowed to live with relative freedom, or at least as much freedom as a contained SCP can earn. His health condition severely limits his mobility around Site-66, a low-security residential containment area. Unable to walk even moderate distances, SCP-4409 heavily relies on the use of a cane and a heavy-duty walker, capable of supporting up to 140 kilograms. Researchers listen intently at his door, waiting to hear if he's ever going to play a sad song on his trumpet, but no sound ever emerges, except for his heavy breathing and spluttering coughs. It appears that having spent decades locked in a small cage, a sedentary life is all he knows now. With every opportunity to exercise, read books, and take up new hobbies, SCP-4409 appears unable to engage with anything other than sitting and staring at the same spot on the wall every day. If an animal has spent its whole life living in a zoo and finds in its old age that one of the walls has fallen down, what use has it in taking a step outside? It had been a long dig. Expeditions like this were normally tiring, but with the intense heat of the Egyptian sun bearing down on them, every minute felt like hours, and every hour a lifetime. Seth and Kayla were determined not to quit. They had traveled halfway around the world to get to this site, and they weren't about to let the elements stop them from uncovering the secrets they were searching for. The rumors had dated back centuries, stories of a hidden tomb lost somewhere out in the desert. And as a likely pair of budding adventurer and an accomplished archaeologist, neither one of them could resist the chance to try and hunt down the tomb. If they could uncover it, they'd have one of the greatest archaeological finds of the century on their hands. Both Kayla and Seth would forever be remembered as the ones who discovered a supposedly unfindable ancient tomb. Having found their way to some ruins, the remains of a temple that had been all but razed to the ground, ravaged by the forces of time, Kayla and Seth had started searching for the tomb's entrance. The reason it had stayed uncovered for so long was the amount of sand that had covered it over the centuries, storms from the desert constantly rearranging the grains and piling on more. But right now, the skies were clear, and all they could do was keep digging, until, at long last, their shovels struck stone. Clearing a path to the entrance, Kayla flipped on a torch as she led her archaeologist friend down a flight of stairs carved into the stone. Seth followed her as they traversed further and further down, the air getting stale the deeper they went. The whole while, there was a gnawing concern at the back of both of their minds, that the rocky ceiling above could give way at any moment, trapping them both underground. But before each of them could voice their worry out loud, they arrived at a large stone door, left wide open about 20 meters beneath the surface. Is this really it? Kayla asked in disbelief. It might be, Seth replied, the excitement in his voice like that of a kid on Christmas morning. Standing before them, beyond the threshold of the open entrance, was a chamber of stone. Its ceiling was secure, about seven meters high, 
and the walls had been covered in hieroglyphics. Immediately, Seth shot over to the nearest wall, pulling a battered journal out of his bag to start to try to translate what had been written. While he was doing that, Kayla's attention fell over the rest of the room. For a tomb, there was a surprising lack of a sarcophagus, nor any other similar resting place for a body, with no signs that anyone else had already been here to remove one either. All there really was within was a few bowls, randomly placed around the chamber. Kayla's torchlight fell over one of the bowls, and she knelt down to take a closer look at its contents. It was filled with bread. They were all holding different foods, dates, figs, dried fish, and lentils. Of course, it wasn't uncommon for offerings to be left with the deceased during an ancient Egyptian burial, but strangely, none of these perishable foods seemed to have decayed in the centuries this tomb had been lost for. In fact, it all looked quite fresh, like it was still good enough to eat. Although the temptation to actually eat any of it quickly disappeared when Kayla reminded herself that, while it might not look it, the food down here had to have been hundreds, maybe thousands of years old despite how perfectly preserved it appeared. I think I've got something, Seth called enthusiastically. There's definitely a story in these hieroglyphics. You sure we're in the right place? Kayla asked as she crossed the room to where her colleague was. For a tomb, it doesn't seem like anyone was ever buried here. I've got a theory, he replied. This place might be more of a metaphorical tomb. Right, that makes complete sense. Her sarcasm was unmistakable. Look here, he said, pointing to one of the drawings on the wall as he spoke. It depicted a figure laying dead in a square space. I think that's meant to be this room. Someone dies here, and then... Seth's finger moved to another of the hieroglyphics, one that Kayla recognized. It showed a being with the body of a man and the head of a jackal, taking the dead figure down into the afterlife. This was Anubis, one of the ancient Egyptian gods associated with the afterlife. According to legends and other texts gathered from the pyramids in Giza, Anubis oversaw the process the Egyptians would perform to embalm their dead, preserving them for their trip to the next world. Anubis takes whoever they are to the judgment hall of the afterlife to be brought before, Seth explained only to be cut off. Osiris, god of fertility, the afterlife, and the dead, Kayla interrupted. She had already spotted the next being depicted in the glyphs, a tall figure with a distinctive headpiece holding a symbolic crook and flail. Oversaw resurrection, life, probably many other things. Yeah, he was a god with a few different hats, Seth attempted to joke. Well, just the same one hat he's always shown wearing. Also, technically not a hat, the atif was a type of crown, and... So, hold on, Kayla interjected again. Didn't Osiris only bring the pharaohs in for judgment? Who was this person that died? I mean, the Egyptians never went to this amount of trouble for their average Joes, and the gods wouldn't pay them any mind unless they were important somehow. I'm not sure, Seth answered earnestly. At any rate, this could all just be a myth. That's why I think this tomb is metaphorical. It wasn't built to house a dead person, but to keep people believing. She finished his sentence for him. He then pointed out the next part of the glyphs, the dead figure arriving in the afterlife, carried by Anubis for judgment, and then handing an object to Osiris. Seth explained there was a certain myth surrounding Osiris and his resurrection, a story that told of all of his dead body parts being found except one. Without it, the god could not be fully resurrected. My theory is that is Osiris's missing appendage, as it were. Seth's face was red as he tried to keep his composure. After our mysterious friend handed it over, the hieroglyphs showed the nameless dead figure being taken from Anubis's hand by Osiris, who then placed them back in the room they had started in, the same chamber Seth and Kayla were standing in. It seemed they had been resurrected after death. Giving Osiris something that the god had wanted had earned this figure a free pass back to the land of the living. The glyphs also showed bowls of food around the tomb, like the ones Kayla had found dotted around the room. There was a type of aura drawn around the unknown figure now, almost like a personal shield. According to the drawings and symbols on the walls and Seth's hastily translation of their meaning, this was some form of protection granted by Osiris himself. The aura was meant to prevent the figure from harm, meaning they couldn't die again. However, the next portion of the story showed Anubis damaging the shield, possibly out of jealousy or spite or perhaps defying Osiris, tampering with the natural order of things by protecting the figure from death. As well as causing damage to the aura of immortality that Osiris had bestowed upon them, Anubis drained the figure of all of their blood. 
which then caused them to go and do the same to others, Seth continued interpreting aloud. It would find people, drink their blood to sustain it, like, don't say it, Kayla sighed. I mean, it's a lot like a vim. Egypt gave us mummies. They can't have another native monster from horror B-movies, she interrupted. Well, maybe the legend found its way here somehow, or at least a more ancient Egyptian version of it. Her counterpart tried to reason. It looks like here the figure was far healthier after consuming blood. See how the aura around them is repaired now? But Seth, look at what they're standing on, Kayla whispered. One of the final images in the glyphs did display exactly what Seth had described, but beneath the feet of the figure, who now seemed replenished, was a mass of bodies, a pile of human corpses with one person standing at the very top. Who would want to live forever anyway? Kayla muttered almost inaudibly. Hey, come and have a look at these. Leaning over, she picked up one of the food bowls from the floor, brimming with offerings of dates. She handed it to Seth, who marveled at how well-preserved the food was. That's incredible, he remarked. This bowl looks like it's at least several thousand years old. I guess maybe 2500 BCE, but the dates... He picked one out of the bowl and sniffed it, put it back, and then did the same with another, making sure it wasn't a fluke. The conditions couldn't possibly have kept them fresh. So, how is it there are bowls of food all over this room that still look edible? She asked. I honestly have no... He began to say... But the sound of heavy, grinding stone interrupted Seth's sentence. Both he and Kayla looked in horror as they witnessed the entrance of the tomb being sealed, the heavy stone door dropping moments away from sealing them in. Seth, we need to run! Kayla urged, grabbing her bag. If we move now, we can get out of here before we get shut in. But... Seth protested, looking around the tomb, the glyph walls that had only just been discovered. Nobody would know that he and Kayla had found them if they ran now. He looked around the room, pondering for a moment, his eyes darting from a bowl of bread to the bowl of dates in his hands. We should at least take photos! No time! Our lives aren't worth proving what we found. Better to make it out than be buried alive! Kayla shouted, darting towards the entrance, ducking under the slowly lowering stone door. Seth, come on! She called from the other side. Despite her calls for him to move, her fellow explorer didn't follow. He just stood there watching the door get lower and the only way back to the surface get narrower. By the time it had completely closed, Kayla's voice sounded so much further away that Seth could barely make out what she was saying. I'll get help! Find some way to get you out! Kayla screamed at the wall, now separating her from the tomb. If you can hear me, Seth, ration the water in your bag. Take small sips every few hours. Seth already knew that the human body could survive around three weeks on just water and no food, and he trusted Kayla would have figured out how to get him out by then. He gave another glance to the food bowls scattered throughout the tomb, the idea of eating any of it. Knowing how old it all potentially was did turn his stomach a little. But if it came down to having to eat just a bite in order to survive a little longer, Seth was sure it looked fresh enough to still be edible. It couldn't hurt to take a bite, right? Over the next few days, Seth's focus was spent entirely on photographing and transcribing more of the hieroglyphics, occasionally stopping to take swigs of water from his canteen. If anything, it was more to combat how warm and stuffy it was being locked inside the stone chamber 20 meters underground. Meanwhile, unseen to Seth, outside Kayla was working tirelessly to try and figure out a way to get the door open. She had been searching for days for any sign or some kind of switch or lever that would unseal the chamber entrance. There had to be some mechanism that had caused the stone door to shut itself in the first place, but there was nothing around that looked like it fit that description. As much as she urged Seth to abandon his archaeological finder's keeper's pride, Kayla was hesitant to make the long journey back across the desert to Cairo to get help. Anyone she brought to the dig site might claim the discovery as their own, and more to the point, the more time she spent traveling across the desert for help, the more time Seth would spend trapped, succumbing to gradual dehydration and starvation. Little was Kayla aware, it was already too late. Seth hadn't been observing her warning about managing the amounts of water he was drinking, and pretty soon, his canteen was empty. He cursed himself, annoyed for being so involved in his discovery that he'd now potentially put his own life at risk. But then he remembered the food bowls. Kneeling down, he picked up the nearest one, the same bowl with all the dates in it. Shaking his head at the thought, he put them back down again. The longer he waited, the more Seth began to worry that maybe Kayla had abandoned him. And if she had, then he was faced with the inevitability that he would die down here, lost and forgotten in an ancient tomb underground. 
He couldn't help but find something ironic about the whole thing. He was going to die in a tomb whose walls told the tale of a dead person being brought back to life. Maybe in a few hundred years, more archaeologists would find this buried room and think he was the one the tomb had been constructed for. Even trying to put an ironic spin on things wasn't enough to give Seth much peace when staring down the possibility he might not see the sun and walk above ground again. And getting closer to death is what made him want to avoid it, tempting him towards the bowls of food. Every time he tried to remind himself not to touch any of it, the pain in his stomach swelled even greater, reminding him of his own hunger. With no clear view of the sky, Seth had little clue just how many days he'd been trapped in the tomb, although he was sure it was approaching the day four threshold. He couldn't survive much longer beyond that point without eating. As the days dragged on, he abandoned his research and note-taking. It was impossible to focus on translating hieroglyphics when he was in so much pain, aching from the heat and having no food or water, exhaustion causing him to pass out his body trying to conserve its already limited reserves of energy. Eventually, Seth started trying to rationalize eating at least a date or two. The food hadn't decomposed or rotted at all. Even introducing air from outside when the tomb was first open hadn't changed the state of any of it at all. Not the dates, nor the bread, or the fish. It still looked fresh and edible, and after God knows how long without eating, it was beginning to look all the more appealing to the starving archaeologist. Who cares if it had been there for a thousand years or longer? If Seth didn't eat, he knew he wouldn't last much longer. The moment he chewed on the first date, feeling it pass down his esophagus, passing from his mouth to his stomach, Seth immediately regretted giving in to his need to eat. His mouth instantly went dry, far worse than it had been after this long without water. It was like the tiny piece of fruit had pulled all the saliva from his mouth. Seth tried to scream in panic, only to release a hoarse, dry-throated grasp as he felt his tongue shriveling up with his mouth and throat until it felt like the skin of a drum. But it didn't stop there. It only got worse. Seth stared in horror at his own arms, the blue veins that ran underneath his skin rapidly draining away. His forearms and biceps shrunk, muscle and sinew shriveling like his body had been left in a water evaporator. All the while, the pain of having his entire physical form being reshaped was pure agony. The dehydration of his mouth meant Seth still couldn't scream, only dropped to the ground as he felt the same thing happening to his legs. Every drop of moisture in his body, every fluid from water to blood, saliva, and even urine was drying out, leaving Seth as little more than a dusty, desiccated husk. Before his own eyes, he could only watch as his skin lost its pigment, drying into a thin, leathery texture, drained of its original color as his blood stopped flowing. Outside, Kayla had been coming back to the tomb's sealed door every day and would stay until the late hours of the evening. She tried digging down from the surface to reach the chamber where Seth had been trapped, but it was too far underground. There was no sign of any way to move or reopen the stone door. That is, until she heard the heavy grinding of it opening on its own. Kayla raced down the steps towards the tomb. It had been five whole days since she and Seth got separated, and he'd need food and medical attention. Sprinting into the dark tunnel, she arrived just in time to see the entrance reopening, expecting to see Seth standing on the other side as the stone door lifted. What she saw instead was a nightmare. It looked like a corpse, an ancient and decomposing dead body. Kayla had seen plenty entombed in sarcophagi on her many travels exploring ancient ruins around the world, but she had never seen one standing up. It was still breathing, a wheezing, raspy sound escaping its mouth. Its skin looked almost brittle, as if it was stretched too thin, almost see-through enough to show off the bones underneath. The upright corpse's face was all wrong, too. Sunken cheeks and eye sockets deeper than they should have been. It looked so different that it wasn't until Kayla shone her flashlight on its drained face that she recognized who it was. Seth. He lunged at her immediately, racing towards her, snarling with his dry, desiccated mouth. Kayla turned and ran as he came after her, bony fingers swiping at her clothes. Her flashlight gripped in her hand was all but useless as she sprinted back the way she'd come, swinging back and forth in her arm, barely illuminating much of the cavern that led to the tomb. The whole while she was running from it, she could hear the wheezing behind of Seth behind her, terrified of whatever he had become and why he was chasing her. Then she saw it, the stairs, her one shot at getting out and getting away. If she could make it to the surface, she could put some more distance between herself and the drained, dehydrated corpse. All she had to do was make it up. 
the last step. She had just made it when she felt the shriveling hand grip her ankle, tripping her over. Falling face first in the sand, Kayla scrabbled at the loose grains, trying to pull herself away as her body was dragged back down onto the stone stairs. She felt a searing pain and screamed into the empty desert as the corpse's fingers dug into her neck, its leathery dry skin against hers. Eventually, the screaming stopped, replaced with a dry, hoarse gasping, and then silence, as Seth drained her body of her blood along with the rest. Pulling Kayla's body by her ankle, Seth dragged whatever was left of her back down towards the tomb, SCP-3359, to feed on what was left. In 1914, an Archduke of Austria-Hungary was shot by a Serbian nationalist. This led, after a series of nations signing treaties with other nations, to one of the bloodiest conflicts ever fought. A war that was unlike any that had been fought at the time. Trench combat, mud, and sandbags. Newer, deadlier advancements in the art of warfare. Vile, incurable, and fatal diseases. And months upon months of misery, all while trapped in dark, dank dugouts. The Great War. The First World War. It's gone by many names since its ceasefire in 1918. And while there aren't many left of the generation that remembers it, there are still plenty of scars left on the world that remind us of the horrors. But there's one that seems to be keeping those wounds fresh, reminding us that war is, indeed, hell, as that rough beast slouches towards its destination. This is SCP-2574, what appears from the outset to be nothing more than a stone sculpture of a lion comprised of sandstone and living tissue. Standing at around 12 meters tall, SCP-2574 is much more than a mere statue. In fact, it is a living creature. After all, this is the SCP Foundation we're talking about here, where inanimate objects are rarely inanimate at all, or will at least possess some form of anomalous properties setting apart anything ordinary, and thus drawing the interest of the Foundation. SCP-2574 is similar in that regard, and not just for being a living statue creature. For one, the anomaly is capable of movement, albeit at a gradual rate that only progresses between 3 and 5 kilometers per day. Attempts by the Foundation to slow or halt the movement of SCP-2574 have been so far unsuccessful, as it seems that any obstacle placed in its path are unable to deter it. This includes both man-made and naturally occurring obstructions, meaning there is little that can be deployed to keep SCP-2574 physically contained. Even if a body of water is in its path, the entity can swim at a rate of between 2 and 3 kilometers per day, and will normally either crush or climb over any obstacle on land. At the previous annual budgeting meeting, the top minds of the Foundation's accounting department revealed to an infuriated O5 Council that SCP-2574 had been responsible for an estimated total of 25.3 million US dollars in damages since its discovery. The second most pressing matter raised during that presentation was that 112 deaths and a further 625 injuries the anomaly had also caused. Despite pleas from the Ethics Committee, the Foundation accountants were still adamant that the cost of damages was more significant. Now, a number of prevailing questions might be plaguing you regarding SCP-2574. For one, what does this creature want? If it has freedom of movement and can't be physically obstructed by the Foundation, then is it just aimlessly wandering free and causing wanton destruction, or does it have a specific want or goal it seeks to attain? And for another, what does an almost 40-foot-tall lion have to do with World War I? Well, it might surprise you to know that SCP-2574 has everything to do with the Great War. Literally, everything. And as for a goal, it has one. Or rather, it has a specific destination it seems to be gradually heading towards. And if it makes it all the way there, it could spell disaster for the entire globe. In fact, it could plunge us back into one of the most devastating conflicts the world has ever seen. Can you guess which one? SCP-2574 possesses a wide array of latent anomalous effects, beyond its general functionality and movement. Above the sandstone lion creature, it is constantly surrounded by a flock of around 6,000 birds of prey. 
Any that find themselves flying into the path of SCP-2574 are assimilated into the growing flock, designated as SCP-2574-1. The mass of birds is fixated on attacking SCP-2574, swooping low to strike at its smooth muscle tissue with using their beaks and talons. This, however, seems to do little to deter SCP-2574 from making progress, as the anomaly constantly regenerates from physical damage it incurs from SCP-2574-1. Perhaps the most notable and noticeable of SCP-2574's anomalous properties is the effect it has on its surroundings as it progresses towards its destination. The area around SCP-2574 will undergo a physical transformation in response to the presence of the lion. This transformation results in the nearby region temporarily becoming a World War I-era combat zone. The ground below becomes riddled with trenches carved through the earth. Thick, muddy bogs and coiled, razor-sharp nets of barbed wire litter the area. The change triggered by SCP-2574 is hardly just a cosmetic one either. The Foundation have observed a number of First World War-related manifestations that occur in the wake of SCP-2574. Man-made landmasses like trenches and dugouts will appear nearby, the front lines reappearing after more than a century. Weaponry from the area is also present following the arrival of SCP-2574, and this isn't just limited to firearms. World War I was one of the earliest large-scale conflicts in history, wherein both sides deployed aerial attacks through the use of biplanes, as well as chemical warfare. As a result, signs of these can also be found whenever SCP-2574 is nearby. But again, the transformation SCP-2574 brings about is not just limited to recreating battlefields. What some of you may not know is the Great War did not so much revolve around a core idealistic difference between both sides as its successor did. Instead, the First World War was a geopolitical grudge match between large global superpowers, attempting to make grandiose displays of their amassed military strength. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria at the hands of a Serbian extremist group was the catalyst that set off a chain reaction of events that ultimately led to war. As a result of this, SCP-2574's anomalous influence also extends to the social and political state of the areas it enters. A country that the Sandstone Leonine entity enters will suffer a rapid change in its local population's mentality. The ordinary people living there will start to experience a great degree of discontent towards their government, while the ruling powers of said country will increase its use of force against its own civilians. This effect is more noticeably potent when SCP-2574 interacts with countries that were directly involved in the First World War, increasing levels of civil unrest and discontentment among the population. These are often countered with worryingly increased levels of police brutality, along with governments enacting aggressive foreign policies and sometimes antagonizing other countries, as if they are eager to fight. These effects don't necessarily worsen the closer SCP-2574 gets to a particular country, but do seem to increase the more it approaches its predicted destination. And where is that, you may ask? The Foundation have calculated that based on SCP-2574's trajectory since its emergence back in 2012, the entity is headed for the city of Sarajevo, the capital city of Bosnia and Herzegovina. What possible reason could SCP-2574 have for wanting to venture towards this specific Bosnian city? Well, one cursory glance at the history of Sarajevo will give you the answer. It's where the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand took place, the event commonly attributed with starting the First World War. The transformative effects SCP-2574 has on its surroundings began when the Leonine Leviathan first appeared and commenced its journey towards Sarajevo on December 24, 2012. Since then, the SCP Foundation has been closely monitoring the sandstone creature's movements and attempting to log all of the anomalous effects it has had over the course of making its way closer to the site of Franz Ferdinand's assassination. Over 5,000 kilometers away, to the east of Kazakhstan's capital, Astana, SCP-2574 caused an unusual World War I anomalous effect. Any written works published in either Russian or Kazakh 
began to randomly feature passages from Irish poet W.B. Yeats. These extracts from his body of work range from single sentences to entire poems being featured in other writers' publications, regardless of author or genre. Yeats, for anyone unfamiliar, was widely considered one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. However, unlike the authors of numerous poems and songs to come out of the First World War, W.B. Yeats was never directly involved in the conflict itself and didn't write much about it, barring a few notable exceptions, but more on him in a moment. When SCP-2574 approached Russia, things started to escalate. Clouds of deadly chlorine gas, an early World War I chemical weapon, began forming in rural areas throughout Europe that couldn't be dispersed for days at a time. As soon as the towering anomaly got close enough, Russian military forces began launching a series of drone strikes and aerial bombardments targeting SCP-2574. When these attacks failed, tensions mounted with bordering countries, the situation only getting worse when it was discovered through an intelligence leak that Russia was planning a nuclear strike against the creature, a move that likely could have spelled disaster for the neighboring countries. SCP-2574, of course, sustained no damage and continued on its course. Given that they couldn't physically contain SCP-2574, the Foundation was forced to think outside of the box when it came to coming up with some kind of solution. There were already too many eyewitnesses aware of the Leonine Leviathan's existence to consider administering amnestics, even on a large scale. The fact was, too many people already knew about SCP-2574 and would make such a move pointless. The best that the Foundation could do to combat, if not counteract, the effects of SCP-2574 was to work directly with governments affected by the creature's World War I transformative effects to try and repair the damage left in the anomaly's wake and ease the tension and violence it caused. It became the Foundation's job to deter any country planning an armed military response to the presence of SCP-2574, as any such strike would endanger both their military and civilian populations while causing no damage to the anomaly. In the interest of trying to solve the problems posed by SCP-2574 reverting parts of Europe to hellish First World War era battlefields, the Foundation made a rare agreement to collaborate with another large organization specializing in the anomalous, the Global Occult Coalition. Working directly with the GOC, their goal was to create a large-scale mimetic countermeasure that would effectively reset the toll SCP-2574 had exacted on global psychology by altering people's temperaments and creating mass political unrest as it progressed towards the Bosnian capital. However, given the tense history between the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition, their attempts at creating a mimetic countermeasure are still ongoing, since neither group wants the other to engage them in full-scale mimetic warfare. As such, the proposed countermeasure will consist of two parts, with neither organization being able to replicate the other's half. Meanwhile, SCP-2574's progress across Europe was responsible for a number of other significant changes, physically, socially, and politically recreating the conditions of the First World War. Poppies, a flower that has since become synonymous with the remembrance of the conflict, began to grow in regions within Russia where they wouldn't naturally occur. This included within urban locations, the red flowers sprouting in and around buildings. As a result of such a high-profile anomaly causing such widespread unrest to spread, a number of religious cults centered around SCP-2574 began to form. While the living descendants of World War I veterans began suffering from vivid hallucinations that depicted their ancestors' first-hand experience of the fighting, these cults began to amass more and more of those affected by SCP-2574. The SCP Foundation was able to observe some of the sermons delivered by these religious cults, who appeared to view the public appearances of SCP-2574 as signs of an impending apocalypse. Come to us and embrace your salvation! One cult leader exclaimed in a sermon, Discover the words of the prophet Yates, who spoke this sacred truth that all of history is a spiral and that we have spiraled outwards towards chaos! Learn the true nature of the second coming! It appeared that some of these cults viewed the poetry of W.B. Yeats 
as prophetic in regards to SCP-2574. They would often reference the Second Coming, which, interestingly, was the name of one of his poems written in the aftermath of World War I. Yeats's The Second Coming refers to a rough beast slouching towards Bethlehem. The SCP Foundation has since uncovered some erratic writings made by the poet before his death that allude to Bethlehem, despite no record existing of him ever traveling there. It is believed that Yeats somehow figured out what SCP-2574 was, and that the closer it gets to its destination, the more civilization will spiral further out of control towards total, all-consuming chaos. Further research by the Foundation also uncovered a testimony made by Gavrilo Princip, the Serbian man responsible for assassinating Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, and thus sparking the First World War. Princip seems to have had had some knowledge about SCP-2574, and apparently killed the Archduke as a way to begin the creature's journey in order to make society more chaotic. With SCP-2574 progressing worryingly closer to the site of Franz Ferdinand's assassination, further chaos rapidly began to spread. Anarchic sentiments took hold of most of Europe, leading to an increased rate of violent encounters between civilians and police in many countries, including Ireland, France, Great Britain, and Italy, with a number of these experiencing widespread rioting in their major population centers. Any government or political party compelled by SCP-2574 to openly espouse the same anarchist sentiments were soon seeing a rapid increase in their public approval, gaining more popularity in polls than their opposition. As a result of these heightened tensions between the public and the government of their countries, assassination attempts of politicians saw an alarming increase of around 60%. SCP-2574 caused countries that had existing hostile relations to engage in armed skirmishes at their borders, with at least one of these battles occurring every two weeks, and each time threatening to spark a much larger scale conflict. Thanks to the anomaly's effects, the international tensions, dissolving alliances between countries, and adoption of nationalism, which were all factors leading to the start of the Great War, were beginning to rapidly spread once again. By the time SCP-2574 was around 550 kilometers from Sarajevo, people began experiencing injuries common among soldiers during World War I. Many patients would die during surgery, only for their bodies to disappear shortly afterwards. Conflict erupted between Ireland and England, and as SCP-2574 entered Bosnia and Herzegovina, many began to report suffering intense dreams about the anomaly. A number of these reports seem to state that SCP-2574 was attempting to communicate with them, and multiple websites began logging the Sandstone Lion's appearance in their dreams. And things will only get worse the closer SCP-2574 gets to Sarajevo. SCP-2574 contains the raw energy of World War I, one of the most catastrophic events in human history, a global conflict with a death toll in the tens of millions. The SCP Foundation estimates it'll reach the site of Franz Ferdinand's assassination within a month. And from that point, given the effect it's had on the rest of Europe, there's only one likely outcome when that rough beast slouches towards its ultimate destination. War. The helicopter lurched and rumbled as it made its descent through the Verkoyaninsk mountain range. Conditions were harsh, with fierce winds ripping through the valleys. At any point, a blizzard threatened to strike. Just about managing to touch down, Mobile Task Force Lambda 9 was glad to be out of the vehicle, even if it meant stepping into knee-deep snow. There were eight operatives in total. Early reconnaissance suggested that they were the only people present within a five-kilometer radius, at least. That's certainly what they hoped. L9 operatives 1 through 6 all made their way up through the mountain pass, leaving 7 and 8 guarding the chopper. This was a simple reconnaissance mission. They would need to search the bunker for any signs of life, gather intel, and get out, hopefully before the snowstorm hit. All 8 of them were kitted out with the Foundation's Keter-grade cutting-edge anti-psionic plating. The operatives had all been chosen carefully, with L9-1 the leader, being an experienced soldier, serving 11 years in the unit. He had capable psionic powers himself, 
and approached L9-2, who showed some of the same gifts. All of a sudden, as the group rounded the final pass and caught sight of the facility, both 1 and 2 experienced severe migraines. Battered by the Russian wind, they had no choice but to get to the bunker as fast as possible. It looked relatively unassuming, a small concrete slab sitting amongst the mountains. The six of them gathered around on either side of the doors as number three forced his way inside. Following standard breaching maneuvers, the rest of the team followed suit, charging in through the open doorway and immediately tipping forward into an abyss. They all landed hard side by side on the slope, some of them rolling down, clattering against each other and eventually skidding to a stop. Very gingerly, the group started to get back to their feet and catch their breath as the wind had been knocked out out of all of them. They weren't in a research facility at all. The Soviet concrete walls they'd been expecting, the old computers and the lab equipment were all missing. Instead, they were standing in a void, infinite and white, with no seeming end in any direction. Beneath their feet and curling up above them was an enormous double helix, a rainbow of colors weaving in and out of one another. It was like they had found themselves standing on an enormous strand of DNA. Floating all around them were glowing orbs of light. None of them could tell how near or far these orbs were. They could have been close enough to reach out and touch, or they could have been on the other side of the universe. And slowly, one by one, they noticed the doorway that they had come in through. It was perpendicular to the double helix and floating about three meters above their heads. Through it, they could see the snowy Russian mountains, their only chance of escape. Four murmured something about needing to leave. One argued back at him. They had no idea whether that door was real or an illusion. They had no idea if they would even be able to pass through it. Besides, it was three meters above their heads and floating out over the void, it was risky. But four didn't care much about receiving permission. Taking a few steps back further down the double helix to get a good run up, he braced himself and sprinted as fast as he could before jumping and reaching for the open doorway. It was as if gravity was suddenly much stronger. As soon as he stepped off the double helix, Four was wrenched downwards, tumbling and spinning, accelerating faster and faster. He let out a petrified scream that sent the other operatives cowering. There was no bottom, at least not as far as they could see or hear. Four's body just got smaller and smaller and his screams quieter and quieter for several minutes until the agents couldn't hear him anymore. And yet inside the heads of one and two, the psionic members of the group, that screaming sound only seemed to grow louder. December 25th, 1962. A man walked briskly through the West Berlin train station. He'd shaved his head the night before and trimmed his beard down to a thick mustache. Dark sunglasses covered his eyes and a fedora was tipped forward. He hoped that his limp was convincing as he shuffled his way through the crowds. One advantage of wearing dark sunglasses in the middle of winter was that he could constantly scan the faces of those around him, looking for anybody who looked Russian. His train had been delayed. An hour outside of Berlin, the train had ground to a halt. German police officers had walked the length of the carriages, checking everyone's tickets and passports. It felt like an eternity. The man was too old by this point to attempt to run away. Besides, running through rural Germany in the snow didn't sound like the best plan. So he stuck to his cover story and hoped against hope that the fake passport he bought would be convincing enough. Fortunately for him, the officer checked it. He looked to be about 18 years old. The man doubted that the boy would know a Russian passport if it was signed by Nikita Khrushchev himself. But shuffling through the station, his feeling of unease grew. Russian deserters had been poisoned all around him for the prior 15 years. A number of his own colleagues had mysteriously gone missing after feeling disenfranchised by the Soviet agenda. He was such a high-profile target that there was no way the KGB wasn't actively hunting him down at that very moment. He clutched the briefcase tightly and made his way out of the station. His plan had been to call a taxi, but now the prospect of being alone in an anonymous vehicle with only one other person terrified him. His best protection would be to stay out in the open as much as possible. He would walk to the British Embassy, or rather, he'd pretend to limp there. 
Lambda-9 operatives number 7 and 8 stood by the helicopter shivering. Their team had been missing for hours now, and they could see the blizzard slowly covering the mountain range like a blanket. Before long, it would reach them. If their helicopter got buried by anything more than a couple of inches, all hopes of evacuating back to base would be dashed. As soon as their team had gone through the doors into the facility, all radio contact with them had been cut off. The Foundation had suspected that the bunker would be heavily insulated, but if that were the case, surely one of them would have stepped outside to resume radio contact and report what they had found so far. Then, all of a sudden, Seven went limp. He remained standing, but his head and shoulders slumped forward as if he'd fallen asleep. Perhaps he had been standing out here for too long. Eight was about to rouse him when suddenly Seven started talking. Hello? Eight, can you hear me? It's one, are you there? The conversation moved quickly. Somehow, one had been able to reach out to Seven's mind and temporarily take control in order to use him as a mouthpiece to communicate with the Foundation over the radio. This kind of contact would normally have been well beyond what one would have been capable of, but he explained that as soon as they had entered the facility, both he and Two had felt their powers growing immeasurably. The Foundation asked for a situation report, and one updated them about what had happened to Four. Trying to escape through the door, he jumped and fell through the abyss. But what was more sickening was that they had seen Four again. All of a sudden, they had started to hear his screams physically, not psionically, and he had fallen past them just off to their right, almost within touching distance. Having decided that it was too risky to attempt an escape as Four had done, the group of them made the decision to travel further down into the facility, descending along the helix. For the next three hours, Seven is unresponsive. He stands there limp in the snow, hunched forward and not speaking, despite Eight and the Foundation's best attempts to wake him. Command, we found something. The helix branches off a bit. There's a doorway there. I can see inside. It looks like a lab of some kind. We can walk to it. Hopefully it's a way out. Command sent authorization for them to proceed, and so they did. One reported that it appeared that they were back in the real world. The abstract shapes and colors, the infinite void was gone. They were in a Soviet research lab. There was medical equipment everywhere, syringes and jars full of, well, maybe it's best not to know what was in them. As Lambda 9 walked through the facility, checking every corner before rounding out, they felt a profound sense of unease. Surely enough, that feeling was warranted. Rounding the corner, one found some human remains. The man appeared to have been a researcher at one point. His brains were now stretched out and stuck to the walls like silly putty. What the hell happened here? Safely on British soil, the man who had defected from the Soviet Union sat in the interview room, chewing his bottom lip. He had spent so much time focusing on how he would escape with his life that he hadn't spared much thought for what he would say once he was on the other side. They had codenamed him Iceman, but he didn't feel particularly cold at that moment. He felt nervous, but he did his best to hide it. I was a project manager in the Psychotronics Division of the Main Intelligence Directorate. I oversaw Project Redline, which was commissioned by Joseph Stalin following the Second World War. And before he knew what he was doing, he told his interviewer everything. Over 20 million Soviets had died during the Second World War. Their death toll eclipsed that of any other country. Iceman had witnessed it all. So when Stalin had come to him with the task of creating an ultra-powerful psychic weapon, something that could convert the entire world population to adopt Marxism-Leninism, the man had his reservations. Activating a device like that could trigger a war even deadlier than either of the two already experienced that century. He was part of GRU Division P, the Russian arm of highly classified experimental research. Conferring with his team, they devised a plan. They would argue they needed absolute secrecy to carry out their work, even away from the watching eyes of the KGB. Rather than create a weapon, they would create a tool for peace. Instead of promoting the values of communism, they would create a psychic tool to dampen humanity's inclination towards violence and aggression. Their method would be brutal, but a necessary evil. In short, their theory was the psychic mind is often limited by the human body. A young child could have incredible psychic potential, but their physical limitations would hold them back from exercising it. Therefore, they needed to separate mind from body, and they had just the trick for that, traumatic disassociation. 
They would take a young, gifted psychic and tear out their mind in order to transfer that mind into the body of a controllable avatar. Iceman explained that none of them could have expected how much fate would look favorably on them. Just two years prior, the KGB had captured and brought in a set of triplets for them. The triplets were incredibly rare, conjoined at both the head and the torso, with three arms and six legs. It was a miracle they were still alive, so Iceman and his team set to work immediately. They dosed the triplets up with as many mind-altering chemicals as they could physically endure, before electrocuting them for prolonged periods whilst reading anti-violent manifestos to them. It worked. The triplets' minds disassociated, and the Soviets were able to capture it. Iceman was not forthcoming about what they did with the mind or where they transferred it. All he explained was that it worked. They took the weapon to the Norlag Gulag. 50,000 of the most vicious criminals known to man. Luthers, murderers, psychopaths dropped their makeshift knives and refused to move an inch. Even as we threw the gates of the camp wide open, we did that. The final test was on Nikita Khrushchev and John F. Kennedy. From thousands of kilometers away, they activated Project Redline and influenced the two world leaders at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. War was averted, but Khrushchev was furious. He removed the entire team, killing a number of them, and began to weaponize Project Redline. If they could fire it at an advancing army, they'd never lose a single soldier ever again. To do this, it needed to be stronger. They were to implant the consciousness into another subject, torture them further, and disassociate again, amplifying the psychic abilities. Mobile Task Force Lambda 9 were stuck in the facility. The blizzard had been so strong that 7 and 8 had to return to base the previous night and come back. Having spent a night lost and wandering through the helix, descending deeper and deeper, the team had noticed that the world around them was getting darker. Periodically, they could hear Force screaming and falling past them once again before dropping out of sight again beneath them. They had tried to catch him, to pull him back, but he was always just out of reach desperate to be saved. Seven and eight returned and their psychic puppet radio contact was resumed with command. The team found another door. Searching through it, they were horrified to find their own corpses floating in the air in front of them, dressed up in lab coats. Just like the scientists from the levels above them, their brains were stretching out and lying together in some kind of web. Yet further down the helix, they found another door. One and three decided to go inside, leaving the rest of the team standing on the helix, ready to catch four if he fell past again. This time, two was in contact with command through his psychic link to the men by the chopper. He soon reported hearing four screams getting closer and closer. The group stood around, ready to catch him. There he is. I can see him. He's definitely falling towards us. Yeah, I see it too. Command, there's something up with four. It looks like he's spread-eagled. His arms are stretched out. He's, he's screaming. It's not getting louder. It's getting... Flatter. There would be no further contact with 2, 5, and 6. By the time 1 and 3 returned from scouting out the room, they were alone. One couldn't even sense the presence of any of their squad mates anymore. They had no option but to continue to descend the helix into the darkness. The smell of burning flesh filled their noses. The echoes of death were all around them. Voices cried out in pain and fear. And then, new voices, speaking in Russian, cut over the top. Stop it. Give in. Don't resist. Resisting is bad. You'll be punished if you resist. Begin electrical discharge. 500 volts. 3 amps. Increase voltage every minute. The operatives had no choice but to listen to the memory of the triplets being tortured. Not just the sounds, but the emotions that flood them. Those weren't someone else's memories anymore. They were becoming their own. And just as they saw into the mind of the triplets, the triplets saw them in return. Command, it's trying to open me up like it did everyone else, but I can see into it. It's learning from us. It knows of all about me. The squad, the foundation, they're almost on me. It's, it's the conjunction, the scientists, the monsters that made this thing, the ones it knew before it died, was that they wanted it to conjunct. It wants to make us part of it. Don't come back here. It wants to make the whole world part of it. And at that moment, the entirety of Mobile Task Force Lambda 9 dropped dead. In that same moment, a multicolored sphere of energy five kilometers wide appeared over the facility, dwarfing the mountains around it, designated SCP-2664-A. 
For years, the Foundation dropped psionically dampening materials and psionically stumped D-Class personnel into the sphere in hopes of slowing its growth. No other containment measures could be acted upon. That was until 1300 hours on the 25th of December 2000, Christmas Day. SCP-2664-A suddenly fluctuated, releasing an enormous amount of psionic energy that resulted in the brain death of all humans within a 200-kilometer radius. The following day, at 1700 hours, a Global Occult Coalition satellite launched a spherical payload right into the heart of SCP-2664-A. For 13 minutes, tremendous amounts of radiation were detected emanating from inside the sphere, before just as suddenly as it had appeared. SCP-2664-A disappeared entirely, leaving just the payload in its place. Before the Foundation was able to recover the payload, it launched into the atmosphere and was lost. Subsequent reconnaissance operations to the site have confirmed no abnormal radioactive or psionic readings. To all intents and purposes, SCP-2664 appears to be gone. As such, the file has been marked as neutralized. Long may it stay that way. There was blood in the water, but at least the screaming had stopped. It had been an ill-advised party boat floating out in dangerous waters, where a bachelor party full of rich and naive men had ignored every warning. Some had told them, don't you know that pirates operate in these waters? Others had cautioned, you might get confused for pirates and shot down by military boats. Nobody had expected the impossible monster that had actually killed all ten people who'd gone out there on that warm ocean night. But in the chaos that unfolded the day after, they would find out. A cargo ship carrying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of products and valuable raw materials was scheduled to cross those same waters. If they could have gone any other way, they would have. But with corporate shipping deadlines to reach, they couldn't afford to take the scenic route and potentially add over an entire week to an already long trip. The cargo ship would need to take the risk. They would need to face the pirates on their own turf if it came to that. Meanwhile, on a number of secret compounds on land, the pirates were preparing. Their corrupt government shipping sources had given them a valuable tip about the coming ship and they were doing everything they could in order to ensure this flagrant act of piracy would be successful. They loaded fuel into the tanks of their speedboats. They clicked magazines full of armor-piercing bullets into their AK-47s. They slipped on bulletproof body armor and clipped grenades to their belts. They were a terrifying force to be reckoned with, but they had no idea that within a few hours, they would be encountering something far more dangerous. You see, strange things had been happening on some of the world's coastlines. It started with surfers, foolhardy, sun-kissed thrill-seekers with an addiction to catching the biggest waves possible. Of course, there are plenty of surfers who get claimed by the sea every year. It is an occupational hazard, especially for fledgling surfers. But the mysterious circumstances of all the workers had something in common. Blood in the water. Of course, it didn't stop with surfers. Anyone who swam a few feet further than the edge of the water seemed to be at risk. Lonely moonlight swimmers went first, but it didn't take long for whole families to start disappearing in the waves. A few here, a few there. Nothing that most people even noticed, just a whole bunch of unconnected, isolated tragedies. The sea is a cruel mistress, though when looking at these cases, Nobody ever considered that something else entirely could be behind all these terrifying disappearances. But back to the cargo ship, making its way across the turbulent waters. And those waters were indeed turbulent, far choppier than the forecast had predicted. The waves were huge, towering even, but that was no excuse to delay their important mission. Their comms had recently received a communique from the local government about the missing party boat and all its occupants, assumed dead the previous night. Pirates, most likely. The cargo ship had come prepared for this eventuality. The companies sponsoring their efforts had lost too much time and money to let their ships be sitting ducks, floating goodie bags for violent criminals. That's why they'd spent a little extra money on a precaution, heavily armed mercenaries patrolling the ship, ready to kill in order to protect their bosses' products. The scene is set for a bloodbath, and certain things out there in the deep love a good bloodbath. The pirates, ready to make a lot of money by any means necessary, loaded into their ships and speedboats, 
their assault rifles slung on their backs. They took to the waters, howling battle cries as they zeroed in on the cargo ship across the bucking waves. They prepared to fire, but they didn't expect their target to fire back. With no mercy, the mercenaries ran to the edge of the boat and started firing down on the smaller boats surrounding them with machine guns. Several pirates went down, chock full of bullets, dead before they could even figure out what was going on. As their bodies sank amidst the waves, their blood floated on the surface like big, red plumes. While the pirates were shocked at the resistance, they weren't unprepared. You don't get to become the rulers of this particularly tough part of the ocean without being ready to give it even harder than you can take it. In accordance with this, the pirates loaded up the handful of RPGs they brought out with them and fired their deadly payloads at the side of the cargo ship. Boom. 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 The ship was rocked by explosions, knocking over some of the many mercenaries standing on the hull. Some fell, screaming down into the water, where pirates quickly cut them down with bursts of ruthless gunfire. But one mercenary who fell off the back of the boat got lucky, or unlucky depending on your perspective. No pirate spotted him, potentially leaving him safe and sound, until he noticed a large wave coming towards him. It took more than a little water to frighten this hardened soldier of fortune, until he saw something nightmarish hiding in the dark. The flash of white fangs and an ivory jaw. It hinged open and bore down on him as the wave prepared to crash. The mercenary screamed, and after the wave hit him, he was gone. Meanwhile, the violent battle between the mercenaries on the cargo ship and the pirates trying to claim it raged on. Using grappling hooks, the pirates were climbing up onto the hull, having disabled the back rudder with sustained gunfire and targeted bombing. The ship was soon suffused with bloodshed, as pirates and mercenaries gunned each other down in bloody combat. Men were falling left and right, but there always seemed to be more. Little by little, as each man fell, there was more and more blood in the water. Out in the depths, as a storm began to rage and the waves whipped and roared, something hungry could smell and taste the blood. One boat full of pirates kept circling the cargo ship like a hungry shark. One worked the engine with practiced efficiency, while another three aimed AK-47s up at the ship, waiting for the moment when another unfortunate mercenary stuck up his head, ready to receive a bullet. But their true enemy wasn't even on the ship, it was sneaking up behind them. Only the man working the speedboat's engine spotted it before it was too late. A wave rose out of the sea, moving with a speed that shocked even this veteran seafarer. At first, he thought nothing of it, too busy to keep out of the range of mercenary bullets. He was hardly the type to worry about getting wet, and then he saw the teeth. As the wave rose well above his height and only a few feet away, he saw something impossible floating in the water, a shape he'd been seeing hanging above the fireplace in a bar he'd been frequenting for years the jaws and teeth of a great white shark. Perhaps it was just refuse from a dead shark floating in the water. That was the most reasonable explanation, right? But if that was the case, why would the jaws be spreading further apart as though ready to receive him? He screamed so loud that his crewmates first assumed he'd taken a bullet, but when they turned around, they saw the truth. A huge wave was crashing down on them, and they saw the teeth. Not just one set, the one that the engine man had seen, but a different set of teeth for each of them. Hungry shark mouths without sharks bearing down. They all screamed, their desperate sounds of terror blending into an incoherent chorus before being cut off by the crash of the waves. The boat was wrecked, empty and bloodstained when the water dissipated, sinking lifelessly to the bottom of the ocean. But, of course, the worst was yet to come. The anomaly in the waves wasn't satiated. All the mercenaries and pirates it had taken so far were just the appetizer, and now it was ready for the main course. Everyone now on the cargo ship, pirate, mercenary, and sailor caught in between, who was fighting and even dying for money, had no idea what was coming. The wave rumbled and rose behind the ship, getting taller and taller and taller, until even the giant vessel looked like a toy boat in its wake. In the darkness of the wave, hundreds of pairs of gnashing shark jaws, the sharp edges of their teeth glistening, the wave fell upon the ship, sending flesh-eating water coursing through every nook and cranny. When the water cleared, there wasn't a single survivor. 
the ship, irreparably broken, sank to a metal graveyard down below. Nobody in the normal world would even know what happened. For those with a fear of sharks in deep water, this particular anomaly is a living nightmare, and one that the French division of the SCP Foundation has encountered with unsettling frequency. It's been recorded manifesting off a number of different coastlines, and who even knows how often it's manifested out in deeper waters. Despite its Euclid classification, containing this anomaly has been no mean feat. It's involved shutting down a number of coastlines completely on the pretense of animal research, the administration of Class A amnestics to witnesses and Class B amnestics to victims, as well as a complicated disinformation campaign to suppress photos and reports of the phenomenon online. But even with all of these containment procedures in place, many have still lost their lives to the jaws of SCP-054-FR, or the Great White Wave. By the Foundation's current estimations, recorded attacks by the Great White Wave have been fatal 68% of the time, with survivors often experiencing wounds consistent with those of an abnormally bad shark attack. In case our opening case study didn't clue you in, the Great White Wave is a set of ravenous shark jaws, most closely resembling the Carcharodon caracarius, or Great White Shark, manifesting inside ocean waves. Any waves over four meters tall can become a host to a Great White Wave event, with there theoretically being no upper limit to the size of a wave capable of causing this kind of anomalous catastrophe. The power of the Great White Wave's bite is also directly proportional to the size of the wave it manifests on, too. Meaning that, in theory, a tsunami playing host to the Great White Wave could devour an entire town. While every attack that the Foundation has failed to prevent is, of course, a tragedy, the number of attacks has allowed the Foundation to uncover some extremely interesting data. For example, while attacks could happen anywhere at sea, they're most common in the 250-meter ocean radius around a coastline. When a human or non-aquatic animal is present in the attack zone, great white waves move at three times the speed of a normal wave in pursuit of its unfortunate prey. The great white wave isn't picky about its prey either. Divers, swimmers, and even aquatic vehicles like boats or jet skis have been devoured, though the waves seem to show a particular preference for surfers, which is gnarly in the typical sense, but not in the sense that surfers say it. The ghostly shark jaws will only become visible next to the part of the wave closest to the victim, meaning that they often aren't spotted until it's too late. But that doesn't mean it can't consume multiple victims at once. As you saw with the unfortunate sailors and pirates in our opening story, many sets of jaws can manifest in the case of having multiple victims to devour. The actual consumption occurs as the wave crashes down upon the victim, so the only recorded way to survive being on the wrong side of the Great White Wave is to dive into the water before the wave crashes. The French division of the Foundation conducted a series of experiments in hopes of understanding the dynamics of the Great White Wave, which had results both encouraging and disturbing. Based on non-anomalous sharks' ability to electromagnetically sense blood from extreme distances, the Foundation wanted to see if the same could be said for the Great White Wave. After pouring several liters of animal blood into the water of an affected area, they found that a great white wave regularly manifested within two minutes, crashing down and devouring the affected blood. However, an extension of this experiment found an alarming result. The same amount of human blood attracted a great white wave in under 60 seconds. Even a small amount of human blood attracted a great white wave significantly faster than a large amount of animal blood. Interestingly, non-anomalous great white sharks will rarely ever attack humans on purpose. Whenever they do, it's often because they mistook a swimming or surfing human for a seal, their natural prey. You'll often find that most shark attack victims are only bitten once, a common shark behavior known as a testing bite. Once the shark realizes that it isn't eating a seal, it will quickly move along. Yes, this probably won't make the person with a shark bite taken out of them feel any better, but the shark didn't truly want to eat them. Great white waves, by contrast, enjoy eating humans significantly more than animals. But that doesn't mean they won't eat all kinds of animals. Several maritime birds were eaten by a great white wave when they flew in front of the wave that was over four meters tall. We suppose the Great White Wave has never heard the salty old sea dog tale that it's bad luck to kill a seabird. The Foundation discovered a few useful things from their experiments. If you want to avoid getting eaten by the Great White Wave, 
You should avoid getting into the water if you're suffering from any kind of injury. Wounded people are four times as likely to be the victims of attacks, with the Great White Wave manifesting in less than 60 seconds. You can also improve your chances of surviving by following Sam Neill's advice from Jurassic Park. Don't move a muscle. Movement, especially panicked thrashing, has a tendency to lure this unique aquatic predator into your vicinity. But here comes the disappointing part. Other than staying in a landlocked area, there's basically nothing else you can do in order to stop a Great White Wave event. Weapons have proven completely ineffective, with the bullets of even the highest caliber weapons simply disappearing into the wall of water. Stealth, beyond avoiding movement, is also ineffective. No attempt to camouflage the smell of humans has been effective in helping them evade the detection of the Great White Wave. You can probably imagine how many unfortunate D-classes got devoured in the process of finding that one out. The Great White Wave is a disturbing reminder that perhaps we shouldn't worry about what lurks in the deep ocean, when nothing has a greater capacity to destroy us than the unimaginable power of the ocean itself. Now go check out SCP-3760 Like a Doll's Eyes and SCP-1449 Dreamtime Whale Shark for more.